This is Music Relish Podcast. Powered by Riverside. Hello and welcome to Music Relish Podcast. Tonight's show will be discussing Hello. 914 Studios in Blauvelt, New York. Producer extraordinaire Roy Thomas Baker will be reviewing the Dream Academy debut CD or album. And we'll be discussing an excellent guitarist, Jesse Ed Davis. So let's get to the show. How you doing, guys? Doing good. I'm doing, doing good. How you doing? Pretty good myself. Wet and cold up here. We are Mark Lou and Perry. That's right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And, and uh, uh, just to remind everybody, we're available on Podchaser, Pocket Cast, Overcast, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, Spotify, and Google Podcast as well. If you like what you hear, yeah. click like. We are out there. Yep. We are out there in every we're way. There, Sometimes more out there than other times. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. So what do we want to start with, guys? We want to start with some news? I think that sounds Mark, good. Mark, you have yeah. any music news? Yeah. All right, let's start with, with some news. music news. Okay, okay, here we go. And now, music news with Mark Smith. Thank you, Lou. Start the, uh, You're welcome, sh- Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. All right, starting the show tonight with a kind of a sad note. Don't like to do it, but we lost a uh, singer this week. Uh, Robert Gordon died at the age of 75. Oh, yeah. Man. Oh, really? Rockabilly, yep. uh, rockabilly yeah. singer. Yeah. I had one of his Robert albums Gordon. one time. Yeah. Yeah. You gave it to me. I have it. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone out there doesn't know, it's Robert Gordon, best known for his work in the rockabilly revivalist movement of the late seventies. He died. The news was confirmed by Gordon's record label mm. and a GoFundMe page has been set up by Gordon's family last month, noting that the singer had been in the hospital for six weeks as he battled a form of acute myeloid leukemia. Being a musician, I'm sure he wasn't insured, so that's tough, you know. Um, wow, didn't know yeah. much about he him. Did, uh, I just know Link those Ray, I think Link Ray was one of the guitar players on that record, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I got into him. He was originally a punk punk guy, and he was in a band called, yep. um, what was he in? I forgot the name. Tuts Muffin, I think. And uh, when he came to L.A., he did a, someone linked him up with Link Ray, and he did that first album. They did a second album together. Hmm. But uh, he also did. The cover of a Marshall Crenshaw song that I didn't know about, and I listened to that. That's fat. That's great. I love his version. Someday, Which, someday, some way. Yeah. Oh right? yeah, yeah. That's on yeah. that record, isn't it? I heard. Yeah, I heard album. Robert Gordon's version first. Yeah. Yeah. Oh really? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. No, wow, he was. He was in tough. Yeah. He was in tough darts. Just so you know, that was the name of his punk band. Um, tough, late to tough the darts. Yeah, that was his band. They put out an album, okay. and he was okay. on yep. a CBGB comp. Um, he was a New but, York guy, or was he from somewhere else in the country? But I, I, I associate him with New York. Bethesda, Maryland. Hmm. So, uh, grew up loving Elvis Presley. That was, you know, his favorite singer. Hmm. Um, they say that the reason his albums with Link Ray did sell, because they, the first one came out the year Elvis Presley died, and there was kind of an interest in that sound again. Oh, wow. Which I believe, you know. Wow. So, anyway. That song, <laughs> one, two, three, rock a baby boogie. Was that him? He probably covered it. Yeah, might, probably, might, I'm sh- I might have heard his version of that. Yeah, yeah, I'm it's sure cool. he did it on his shows. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that. Robert Gordon. Robert Gordon. Yep. Yeah. yeah, Robert Gordon. That's too bad. Um, a little bit interesting here. If you guys like old Alice Cooper, as in the Alice Cooper band, it looks like he's mm-hmm. going to be working with the original band uh, very soon. He's been cool. working with them on his last few albums here and there. But he definitely said that him, Michael Bruce, and bassist Den- Den- Dennis Dunaway. Dennis Dunaway, yeah, yeah. They're going to start really working together, and they're going to get Bob Ezrin involved. So this could be a seriously oh, man. serious album. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Who did they yeah, lose? Was... Who's the guy that passed away from the band? It Glenn was... Buxton. Glenn Buxton. Thank you. Yeah, 1997. <clears throat> he died. Wait, did you say Neil Smith was also there as drummer? Yeah. He's yeah. the drummer, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yep. So it's, Speaking it's of that, if I may, if I may interrupt, mm-hmm. the uh, Drummond Show, 
to billion dollar babies. Is that not one of the best ones that there was? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And uh, I think Dennis Dunaway was or was playing with uh, the Bouchard brothers from Blue Oyster Cult and like Blue Alice or Blue something. Really? Yeah, really? yeah, yeah. For a while, I don't know if he still is or whatever. They still play together, but yeah, he was. They were together. All right, a dang. Oh, there, yeah. the dinger, plum dinger. <laughs> the book behind me will be dinging the whole show. Stephen Wilson's autobiography. All roads lead to BOC. Stephen Wilson. Um, all right, another totally fluffless. Just so you guys, I know you're going to love this one. The Eagles are going to add more dates to their Hotel California tour. Wow. I guess selling tickets for two to $500 is just irresistible. So they're adding five more dates. Wow. There's only three guys left, though. Who, yeah. So who are the Eagles now? I mean, I Don, of course, I know it's Joe Walsh and Don Henley and Timothy Schmidt, but who are the other mm-hmm. ones? So they Stewart. have Vince Gill in there. He's Vince doing Gill. like – Okay. Uh, yeah, and he – I gotta say, he sounds good. I saw some something on. He's fantastic, Vince yeah. Gill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he handled a lot of the Glenn, uh, Glenn Fry parts. Yeah. Well, they don't, they, yeah. Well, they don't have to pay Deacon, uh, Deacon Fry any, so he's out of the band. So those he's tickets there are anymore. They can buy the pie up with one less slice. I'm That's sure he'll come is. up with his. He'll make his own records. Yeah. yeah. Eventually. Oh, yeah. Well, I I thought I heard that uh, Deacon didn't want to be in music. Really? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I I believe when he left, he said something about. You know, he, I don't know if the music business is for him. He, well, wow. he saw okay. the Eagle side of it. So he's seen a corporation. Mm-hmm. Maybe that yeah. burned him out, you know. Maybe. So Vince Gill will be on retainer. He'll get a great salary. And, you know, maybe you know, Henley for forced him out. <laughs> <clears throat> There's only so much money to divide. He might be Satan, but he's our little Satan. There's a lot you know of money. Next? Joe Walsh will be out next. Then it'll be Probably. just Don. And uh, Don, and or Timothy B. Oh, who's the other yeah. guitar player? Is it Stuart Smith, or am I getting him mixed up with somebody else in Petty's band? Well, before before Glenn Fry died, they had this guy in that was doing <clears> Don Felder's <throat> stuff. He was I think a that's great Stuart multi instruments. Yeah, he yeah. was really good. Stuart, yeah. What's his he, name? He, Stuart Smith. I've seen he, that he, guy. He's good. He knows he's every a, single note. Yep. Every single. It's it's impeccable. Yep. It really is. Yeah. I mean, um, but he's written some of the latter day songs with them too. But in the documentary, he goes, "I'm not an eagle. I don't know. I don't know what it's like to be an eagle." So they're, 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 adding, more, they're adding more dates. Wow. Yeah, well, that's, I, that's that tour is never going to end. There's there's a couple other bands out there that just been going on and on and on with their farewell tours. And, and you know, Joe he, Walsh will always yeah. have a job with his brother in law Ringo. So you know, yeah, Joe yeah, Walsh will right. not be, you know, hello. So the work. thing is, the, the, there's high ticket prices aside. I mean. It's what you do. It's what you do. Why not just keep doing it until you can't do it anymore? Or, you know, like it's a leave when you're supposed to, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But maybe they're, you not, know, they're not supposed to leave yet. Yeah, but, you know, who, you know, sometimes, you know, they, they know that their their followers are like older and like more successful, like for 400 bucks for a ticket. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm not going. I'm not going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, and you also have this new kind of ticket pricing where the ticket price is set by the demand. So I went online to get Bruce Springsteen tickets at the Garden, and I was seeing eight hundred dollars. I'm like, oh man! But if the demand goes down, the ticket price goes down. So Ticketmaster is officially a scalper, really. You know, mm-hmm. right? It's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. No, well, from what I've from what I've read, a lot of the scalpers buy up these tickets online, and then yeah. they they resell them online. Of course, at a yeah. double rate. Yeah. 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 You're limited to what you can in price. do. You can't double the price. You can sell it for higher, but what the scalpers then do is say, okay, if I can't double the price, I'll buy more tickets if I can only add twenty percent on. So they gobble yeah. up fifty well, tickets at a time. Scalpers always find a way to scalp, don't they? Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Why should yeah. I pay fifty cent fifty percent above the VIG? What am I? Something special? <laughs> what am I, what am I on wheels? On wheels? <laughs> <laughs> but then again, you talking. Get- to- I am I smart. Yeah. You hear that, Perry? I want respect. Start respect. You've got it. Do you have something there that says, spec my authority? Spec my authority? <laughs> Car- Cartman? No. <laughs> but you know what? I'm a, I'm a, uh, when it comes to ticket prices, I brought my whole family to see Roger Waters. So I'm not going to say people that spend a lot of money on concerts are dumb because no, I'm one no, of those dumb people. Cost? Back to more music music news with Mark Smith. <laughs> well, the tickets actually were cheap. They were 150 I thought that's a steal by standards now. 
So how many yeah, tickets did right. you buy at a buck fifty? Four. Let's just say my credit card's maxed out. But I bought them before the COVID pandemic, so the show was postponed for two years. Mm-hmm. But still, they can, yet, they can pay it I, back. <laughs> yeah. Yet I saw a Porcupine Tree at Radio City, sixteen rows back. Oh, here we go. And cling tickets were fifty dollars. So you know, that was a beer clink. Doesn't count. All what right. What else do you have on? What, what else is moving on, Mark? Another death. Another death. Oh, Brooks great. Brooks Arthur. Brooks it's... Arthur has died. Oh, the, um, Brooks Arthur. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Albert Brooks, Brooks Arthur, died. Yeah, he sweat too much doing the news. No, his I brother Bob feeling. Einstein died. <laughs> he died what? at the age. Hmm? Who's Brooks? Who's Brooks Albert? Brooks, Brooks Arthur. Al- Brooks Arthur. Brooks Arthur. Yeah, don't freeze your face. We get scared when your face freezes. We don't want to see that. <laughs> he died at the age of eighty-six. He was a uh, engineer. Before you know, in the beginning, he got to start. Uh, in Manhattan, and he worked on, if I got right here, Lou, and I said it last week, and I'm screwing it up already. What was that girl group he worked with? The shangri Remember? Yeah, he that was one of his first things. Yep. Okay. Um, worked in Manhattan my for favorite a few girl years. Group. Yeah. What leader of the pack? That was his handiwork. But who's yeah. your who's your favorite girl group that plays their own instruments? Well, you, it's going to be the Bangles. No. <laughs> I'm going back, like, to the breeders, that kind of thing. But Okay. Yeah, yeah. The runaways. I like the Bengals better than the Go-Go's. Yeah, that's a sidetrack. Yeah. Okay. So Brooks, Brooks Arthur has Brooks Arthur. So he, passed away. He also, he also worked with Love and Spoonful, Van Morrison, and Neil Diamond. But wow. uh, how we know him, and we've discussed this briefly, but on those mm-hmm. shows that are now no more, uh, he – Owned a studio in Bluevelt, New York, five minutes from me on Route 303 that I pass every day on the way to work, 914 Studios. And, uh, Lou, will you say the claim to fame that we know about that studio is? Amongst Don't... other albums, uh, Bruce Springsteen recorded his first two records there, and the single Born to Run was recorded there. The rest of the album was were not. But you know why? Bruce Springsteen. Um, uh, actually, John Landau, his new manager, and the Rolling Stone, well, rock critic, uh, he thought it was a kind of a, a shabby studio. Yeah. Now, yeah. The, and there there was piano problems. I thought I thought I heard it on the first record, but you mentioned yeah. that last week about something yeah. about the piano not staying in tune or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, that might have been on, right. on our after party discussion, but um, yeah, but that that but it was a studio that was you know it was valid though. There was some stuff recorded there, and you know, yeah, there was, yeah Tennessee in, uh, Tennessee in, yeah. Um, what was so, the other one? Well, uh, she's. She stayed in. There was one that stayed. Uh, she stayed actually in the hotel, not the Nyack Hotel on Route Fifty Nine when she was staying. There. I'm reading these articles. And I'm like, this is all my local area. When Bruce yeah. was there, instead of driving back to the shore, they just set up a tent out back and slept out there. And they loved the Blauvelt Diner. They would eat their breakfast there. Bruce said he loved the scrambled eggs. Wow, I, I wonder wow. if I ever ate that. Having eaten almost every diner, you know, three in the morning I after have. the bars type of thing. I didn't know. Was there a Clarkstown Diner too? Yeah. Yeah, I so think I, that I think was I've been, down I think, I, I think I've been to both. But I didn't know 914 was right next door. I didn't know that. So, yeah, yeah. Well, no, you might be thinking of Nanuet Diner, which was in Nanuet. That was another one. No, nah, I boy, uh, <laughs> Who knows? The, the, state, the, yeah. the state line diner. Um, yeah, but, there you so, go. So, Mark, so Mark, 914 Studios, um, why is it named 914? That was the old area code of Rockland County. Before oh, Westchester really? County soaked it up because they had more money than us, so they got to keep their foo foo hmm. area code, and we went to eight four five. But I kind of like eight four five better; it's easier to type, you know. They didn't know 845. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, you know, no. Kinda... Rockland County is just over the border from New Jersey, where we we're all raised. But you live there, yeah. but and I was there. You know, right? it wasn't that far. It was on the way to Harriman State Park in that area. And I heard there's a giant <laughs> plaque there now that they put high up so no one steals it. If you uh, Google at the, the former site of 914 Studios. Yeah, if you Google, uh, do a Google images search, you'll get that plaque. And it's now an auto body shop, and they uh, always have their cars out front every day. But that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah, because it used to be a gas station at one point, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, other artists are recorded there. Melanie, Loud and Rainwright III, Blood, Sweat, and yep. Tears, Ansford and Simpson, Dusty Springfield. That's what I was thinking of. The Ramones and James Taylor. Right. They had a pretty good lineup of artists going through there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Janice recorded it. At 17, that classic song was recorded at 914. 
Right. And yeah. she said yeah. Brooks gave her the confidence she needed. He yeah. kind of, I think he produced it as well. And yeah, may I say, uh, on the 45 version of At 17, Bucky Pizzarelli, a guy I saw mm. plays guitar on uh, the 45 version, the single version. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. Great guitar player. His, yep. his son was a year ahead of me in high school at Don Bosco, John Pizzarelli. Really? Yeah. Really? I like, yeah. and I've, I've, done a lot of John. I've been, I've been around stuff. famous musicians that high in school, you know. John, I found people. it interesting because Bucky he played one of those seven string Gretsch guitars, so it was like those mm. jazz guitars, you know, with the mm. seven strings. Was it a low string or a high string that was added in there? I don't know. It was just uh, probably low, so we could just, do a walking bass line. Doom, boom, boom, mm. You know. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. But he played. Bucky Pizzarelli played on the single version of Janice Ian's. Um, at 17, recorded at 914. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so you know, yeah. Brooks Arthur was there a few years ago and they dedicated the plaque. And I wish I had known about it. Not that I, if I knew about Brooks that in, then I would have gotten there. He was talking to everybody. Mm -hmm. That would have been just cool to shake cool. his hand. You know? Yeah, absolutely. You know who else recorded at 914? Who? Towns Van Zant recorded there. No. Really? Yes, he did. Yep. I, 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 was, I was looking for oh. artists that recorded there. His name never came up. Towns fans and came up on mine. Yep. Wow. wow. Yeah. I Nine one four in New York or maybe South. somewhere else. What about John Paul Jones? He's, John Paul did, Jones I, I, did a record there. I think you're getting some. Are you sure? Yeah. Yep. Nine one four in Blavel. John Paul Jones. Yep. You think you wouldn't have to go that budget rate? I mean, they they, they closed in uh, <laughs> was it seventy eight? They it was sold right. Well, he moved west, didn't he? Mm hmm. He went to L.A. He might have worked with John Paul Jones in L.A. There might be a connection there. But Towns Van Zandt could very well have recorded there. You know, that was his time, right? Was He He was mid-70s, wasn't he? Towns Van Zandt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. Sure. yeah. Well, Towns so, Van Zandt, he was through the 80s, the 80s, too. 80s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I could I could search the John Paul Jones thing. I know he did a lot of movie soundtracks in the 80s. Um, well, what about, what about, uh, what about 914 uh, Brooks Arthur's Partners? Yeah, he's fifty percent owner of uh, an A and R, right? Uh, yep. Phil yeah, Phil Ramon A and R, um, Phil Ramon, yeah. Ramon, yeah, yeah, Art Ward and Don Frey. Yeah, so it's, so Phil Ramon, he well, he's a pretty fairly legendary producer. Frank Sinatra, Billy <laughs> yeah. Joel, most of Billy Joel's yeah. stuff. So he so he owned yeah. a piece Julian of that. Lennon, yeah all, yeah, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, he did yeah. a lot of Billy Joel. That's, that's right, yeah. Julian yeah. Lennon. Yeah. yeah. So they had 16 tracks in 1972. That's actually pretty damn good for 1972. They were state of the art. In the yeah, yeah. You yeah. know it was a two-inch 16-track machine. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys listened? Well, I think the records we all know that were recorded there are the Bruce record. Um, Born to Run took months and months to record, so I don't know if that would have – you know, the rest of Born to Run was recorded at the Hit Factory. Yeah, um, if yeah. Bruce had Bruce... Recorded the, if Bruce had recorded the Born to Run single at um, the Hit Factory, it would have taken less time. Was there – you know, there's not like there might have been some issue, but I mean, I, I think you know, um, Brooks I, Arthur, he, he was I, a a sound engineer, so I would think it was a, he knew what he was doing. With yeah, stuff yep. video. I think Bruce was just really working on it because they said he was coming up between gigs, and it was like a masterpiece, like it was his masterpiece. Oh yeah, and maybe John Landau might have pushed it faster, but then we might not have gotten the Born to Run that we got. So they did a fine job on it. The oh, way well, it was, I, you know? One of his biggest absolutely. songs ever yeah. was recorded at 914 Studios. Right? That, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And the idea behind 914 is that it was out of the way, so it wasn't all that expensive. But um, Right. Brooks lived yeah. a few miles away. It was in Valley Cottage. Yeah, Valley Cottage. Five minutes up through 303. Yeah. Three yeah, because when they moved to the Hit Factory, then it started costing a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That was even more pressure on Bruce to deliver that record. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. It's one. It's one thing that you, know, you go to a studio you can afford, but uh, you know he got a twenty five thousand dollars advance for greeting from Asbury Park. Um, so that was one of the reasons why Mike Appel, his manager at the time, uh, wanted to record a number four. He thought it was a good studio, um, but he said, you know, you can't beat the price. It wasn't too far. You know, figure that that's the drive. I know that drive when I used to live in Red Bank, which is Bruce Land. We used to yeah. drive that up to Park Ridge, which is right on the border. So it's an hour and 20 minutes, you know. It's a long back, Garden State back Parkway th Back trip. then, it was probably a half hour. <laughs> there was no <laughs> traffic. It wasn't, it wasn't insane like it is now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the other thing I, I would love to see, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but someone had done uh, footage of Bruce in the studio recording in 914 Studio, 16-millimeter footage. Wow. It, I wonder if it's on YouTube, but it'll come out someday. 
uh, it was a filmmaker, yeah. a guy that now is, he's a filmmaker. I would love wow. to see that because then we'd see the actual Absolutely. studio. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You can, I'm sure. Yep. So uh, apparently the, back then, I mean, this was early 70s, there was a, they said they, they, they made a football field in the, behind it. I, don't, I can't visualize what it's like driving by there. I'm sure it's just all, everything's concrete now. But yeah, I, they, I, used to, they, used to, they used to sleep in tents and musicians would sleep outside behind yeah. it, you know, when they want to take, get a hotel or travel back to wherever they came from. So that was mostly Bruce, out behind the studio. Bruce would, he did it because they didn't want to stay in a hotel and they could just yeah. walk next door and get their scrambled eggs at the Blauville Diner 24 that, seven, right. you know, yep. right. Dusty Springfield stayed in, mm-hmm. uh, I know exactly where the hotel is. And one of the sound engineers said his job was to drive her back and forth. Nyack hotel was like maybe five minutes away again. It's all Not, close wow. to there. The Nyack hotel. Nyack, first, class Nyack, accom- first class accommodations, hourly rates. It's, it's still there, but, uh, it's right and, by the overpass of New York state Thruway. really good location. Excellent. And bar pizza, bar pizza. I'm being sarcastic. Bar pizzas, yeah. <laughs> Working girls. That's no, it's cool. not that so bad. What, what, so what became of uh, Brooks Arthur before he uh, before he died? You said he moved west, right? Yeah, so he moved out to L.A. and he worked with, um, you know, when, when he was out there, he's mostly known for doing the Hanukkah song with Adam Sandler. No, not right. mostly known, but that's the one I knew. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, he... He just did a lot of work in stage and film, so I'm sure we could look him up and find a lot of things that he was doing. Well, from what, I read in, from what I read, in 1999, he started Brooks Arthur Productions Incorporated in Encino, California. B-A-P. BAP. Yep. Interesting. Hmm. So he and probably you just, know, he just saw yeah. L.A. and said, I can expand, I can do more, and that's what he did. And yeah. Can't blame him. Yeah. And uh, Adam Sandler get, paid him a nice tribute, said, a kind, generous, one of those people, nurturing. Like, he wanted yeah. Diamond 4 to be a place where, you know, you, you, you could nurture your, your talent, you know. I mean, the fact yeah. that, you know, Bruce and not break a, the a, bank. Yeah. Not break the bank. Bruce yeah. had to deal with Columbia Records. That's big time. But, you know, so it's not like he was, um, actually, Adam Sandler said he was a true mensch, which is the Yiddish mm. term. I guess that's just like, you know, wow. good, yeah. that, that's like a Yiddish good fella. Yeah. You know? Uh, a stand-up guy, you know. So it's good. Uh, I was good to hear about people in the industry that were, you know, they weren't the Mars Levies of, of the world. You know, they're actually people doing the good things. And you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. You know, you're you're lucky to come across people like that, and you're and exactly you fall your way to the exactly. top. <laughs> so he lived to be an old man, correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was 86. He lived a good full life. Good for him. Okay, good. God for bless him. him. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 Yep. Good. Good job. Brooks, Good that wasn't job. his real name, though. Oh, Correct? you know his real name? Uh, I thought don't. it was like I th- I, th- I thought he changed it. I thought it was I I don't know maybe. It does sound kind of like a stage name, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was Arthur Brooks. Brooks, Brooks. <laughs> I, maybe it's Arthur Brooks. Yeah. I could be <laughs> Smith Mark. You know. There you go. <laughs> uh, I could be Bob. What's that? What do they call that when you you spell it the same back and forth? Bob. Is that a palindrome? No, it was that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it. I think that's like, it. Yeah. Like mom. Yeah. And and like my birth you're, year. You're you're uh, Ian, right? I'm Ian something. Yeah, I'm Thomas Or, Graham. or uh, radar. <laughs> radar is uh, one of those things, right? It's spell it back and forth. R A D. Oh, wow, I didn't know that one. Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, Thimscram is if you spell my name backwards, so I'm Thimscram. I've always said that. I love that name. How do you, how do you, thin, thin scram? Oh, Thimscram. Okay. That's right. Thin, thin. <laughs> you see these things when you see emails, like where I work, it's our last name and first initial, so I'm Smithums. You know, okay. we all call each other by those names. Hello, Mark, Hello, Mark Smith is an alias anyway, also known as Mark Smith. I will hold up my <laughs> social security card. No, I won't do that. No. <laughs> anyway, so is, that is that it for the news? Yeah, I, that's now, it. When, when I lived in, in uh, New Jersey, I wish I knew where that was. I would have gone there and just, you know. You would have yeah. done a pilgrimage, yeah. I would right? have done yeah. a pilgrimage, yeah, because that, yeah. that's, that's, yeah, yeah. Yep. Having, you know, the Born to Run was just a big record for me i work so with lou, a guy on, on uh, a lot of people lot of i work with a guy here, lou you work with a guy about what at the hospital who would always tell me he was a little flaky and he would say you know bruce springsteen recorded there and i just didn't know whether it was true or not and then when they put yeah. up that plaque then i was like oh crap it's true you know yeah. <laughs> it's true lou do you have a one-hit wonder you want to slip in here i do i do you do 
And it's a pertinent one, one hit wonder to the. Oh, it's pertinent to what we were yeah. talking about, or yes, to the aforementioned subject nine one four studio. Yep. Oh, yep. cool. Yeah, you know, um, cool. It's, I I never heard of the song before, um, so I'm not going to try to like guess you guys on what it is because I mean, if you know this, I'll, I'll just stop ever trying to do trivia because it's it's none of us have ever heard it. Um, but so the song you're talking about was recorded at nine one four. It, uh, no, it wasn't. But the connection to um. Oh yeah, well, let's find out. Oh wait, wait, wait! I got I got my wrong thing here. The... It's okay. Oh, um, it's not this Tommy Tone, is it? No, no. So in relation to nine one four, Bruce Springsteen recorded there, right? Yes. Um. Now Bruce's manager at the time was a guy named Mike Appel. Yes, who was, I've he seen was also it on the a record. songwriter. Yep. yep. Right. So yeah, as you know, they had the contentious split. Blah blah blah. But Mike Appel was also a songwriter and a musician. He was a guitar player. So he is one of the writers on a true one-hit wonder. Really? Uh, yes. Uh, so the band was called uh, The Balloon Farm. The year was 1968. The one-hit wonder is a song called A Question of Temperature. Never heard of it. <laughs> never heard of it. Ne- never, never heard of it. Um, Are you going to play 30- it? Yeah, oh, yeah. It was number 37 <laughs> on the Billboard Top 100. That, that's pretty big. I mean, that's that's up in, into the hey, top 40. Hey, it cracked the top 40. That's a hit. <laughs> Yeah. This is so yeah. obscure. Yeah. You had to tell us. You didn't try to even stump us. You knew it. No, I, I, I never heard the friggin' thing. And I think <laughs> the intro, when you hear it, it, it could be a lot of songs. Actually. Yeah, I'm curious to see if I've ever heard it. Let it ride, yeah. man. I, I, I got one more thing. It was number yeah. one in Vancouver. When you're number one in Vancouver, you know you've hit it. You are yeah. a success. Yeah. Seth Rogen's um, from Vancouver. Cool town. There you go. Uh, they were on American Bandstand. And the writers were Mike Appel, um, Don Henry, and Ed Schnug. I just love that name. He's a that was Mike Appel no, in this band that you're going to play. Yeah, he's playing. He's singing lead, I believe, and playing a lot of. Oh guitar. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, so just bear with me here. Do I have my? All right. It was. Um, I think it's on Lori Records. Anyway, here we go. Yeah, famous label. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So the band is called The Balloon Farm. The song is called A Question of Temperature. Number thirty-seven on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1968. <laughs> Wow. Oh. Like Psychedelic Garage. Yeah. A little bit. Wow. Never heard it. Uh, Lou, you know Alan Klein owns no. that. Hey. Uh, <laughs> there's the title. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean this. <laughs> no, no. It's no problem. So that, that, was a, that was a one-hit wonder. Uh, that's Mike Appel singing lead. Uh, that guy who used to manage Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, yeah. And he, did you hear the noise in the beginning? That's a theremin. Mm-hmm. That's a theremin. Really? Oh, yeah. I love theremins. Yeah. So interesting guy. He also wrote a, a Partridge Family hit. I think it was a minor hit. I don't even know the name of it. I read it, didn't recognize it. Um, yeah, yeah, well, but, you know, it, was on, it was on one of their albums, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. now going back to Bruce Springsteen, like that apparently was a slavery deal from what I heard. It was How a slavery deal. How do you mean? Deal. How do you mean? Bruce, he shouldn't have signed that contract. That's what I, I heard read. Um, it was a rough deal. You know, it's one thing where it's just like, this is mine. That's not yours. That type of thing. So I, hmm. by the time John Landau came around, I think, you know, being who he was in the industry, I, he pointed Bruce in a different direction. Um, you know, but not, not before studios. And I listened to the first, uh, the first Bruce record today, Greetings, from Asbury Park. I had it when I, you know, years and years ago. It's yeah. not a great sounding record. I mean. You know what I mean? I, I guess a different producer and a different, and that studio would do different things. It, the, it, uh, at seventeen was recorded there, and that's a beautiful recording. So the, it's the ears. What's that? The, what's the so- criticism I've heard of it is that his early, like that album, and even the second, too busy, right? Like the well, drumming the, is all the, over. And- the drumming. Yeah. I, I listened to it again. The drumming is all. I mean, it's, it's all over the place. It is but, all yeah. over the place. But Brooks um, Arthur, what did Brooks Arthur do? Was he just the engineer, or did he produce? I don't think he had anything to do to do with that record. He just owned the studio. I think a guy named Jim Kredikos, I think, might have been one of the engineers. Or they, I, I, it was produced by. I mean, yeah, it was produced by Bruce and I think Mike Appel and maybe even Steve Van okay. Sant got a credit on Born to Run. The earlier hmm. stuff, I think, is um, 
Black Capel. I'm not, you know, exactly. Bruce was on there, but there's always been other names on there. Um, even with um, John Landau, I forgot the other guy's name on Bruce Springsteen Records. Chuck Plotkin. He might be in on there. Ooh, but okay. anyway, so but it, it was great. It's it too bad that 904 doesn't exist anymore. It's yeah. an auto body shop now, isn't it? Or some kind yeah, of it's, auto, it's a, de- auto detailing. Yeah, well, auto detail. Well, what, uh, what's still there is A&R Recording Incorporated is still there. I remember being in Midtown one time. And I walk right by, I'm like, hey, A and R recording. It's like, yeah, that's their corporation. They're still there, man. They're still out. They're still at it. Phil Ramone and the other guy. Mm-hmm. Yep. The other guy's um, name is Jack Arnold, right? Yep. Now, Lou, let me just circle helped. back really quick. Yeah, yeah. You know who covered that song, A Question of Temperature? Brownsville <laughs> no, Station. I don't. Brownsville Station on the same the album out. that they put Smoking in the Boys Room, the album, yeah. So oh. I'd like to hear that version. One hit wonder, I believe. No, no, maybe. Yeah. Wait, no, Brownsville Station was not a one hit wonder. I looked that up. They had really? a couple of hits. Yeah, okay. I, I kept getting foiled last week. Every time I had a one hit wonder, it was done. Um, I so got they were, screwed wow, on that. So that, that's that's not only is that an obscure one hit wonder, that's obscure of them to do that. You know, that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. yeah, yeah. And it's a psychedelic garage rock song. It was you psychedelic know, garage. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. A far cry from Bruce Springsteen's meat and potatoes rock and roll. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, yes, do you want to yes. go into Roy Thomas Baker? Yeah, you know, a, uh, I'm humbled. Famous, famous producer, right? I'm humbled because I picked on him a lot when we were on those <laughs> caveman uh, phone things, and I would say, I hate his production, I hate his production. They it's don't really exist quick. anymore, Mark. That never happened. All right. One day, no, those I, had to, I had to do a Target run, like, 9 in the morning. I'm tired. I get out. You, know, you put something in the car. I put candy out. Oh, that's great out in the play. And I realized when I played it in the car, it sounded really good. Just doesn't sound good on a big stereo to me, you know. I and I'm like, all right, I give Roy Thomas Baker a pass. And I started to think about him. I'm like, yeah, he did those like all the albums I complained about the sound, right? You know, like oh, he did this album, that album. I just never connected everything that he did, and it's a pretty incredible career. And um, just a quick background on Roy Thomas Baker. He started mm-hmm. at Decca Records at 14 years old. Obviously, the guy can make tea because that's what you did if you started at a record label in England. He, you know? he, he's <laughs> British or American? British. Born in England. He was born in Hampstead, Northwest London in 1946. So after DECA, he went to work at Morgan Studios, became an assistant engineer. Then he moved on to Trident Studios. I'm sure you guys have heard of that. Yep. At Trident, he, you know, he's an engineer, but he worked with Tony Visconti. He worked with Jagger and Richards, Frank Zappa, Rolling Stones, David Bowie, The Who, Nazareth, Santana, Mothers of Invention, Bebop Deluxe. This is where his career took off you know, working at the studio. Uh, But the big thing that the big launching was when he met Queen and he did produce a bunch of albums for them. He produced their first album, their second album, Sheer Heart Attack, my favorite Queen album, Night at the Opera, not a day at the races, just Night at the Opera. Oh, no, I'm sorry. A day at the races. Yes. Jazz. The two two Marx Brothers, uh, the two Marx Brothers movies that the albums were (laughs) named after. Yeah. Yeah. So he did a lot of work with them. Um, he did some other work in England, and I do have a list of all his stuff. But basically, career-wise, uh, he moved to the United States, set up Roy Thomas Baker, uh, RTB Limited, and that's where he went gangbusters. And uh, among many things he did, he he worked on a Journey album, worked on a band called Star Castle, which I don't know if you guys heard of. They were like America's answer to yes. Uh, he worked with uh, Ian Hunter, you know, Dillip, but then he met the Cars. And when he met, when he saw the cars, he saw them in a school gymnasium before they had, you know, before I get, they were just signed. He agreed to produce their first five albums. Like that's how much the guy liked them. So he went wow. from the first album up to shake it up. So he did. Yeah, that's, that's a big wow. run for them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Big run so, of successful uh, records too. Though. I never heard you. Uh, I never heard you say anything disparaging about Roy Thomas Baker except I, the sound of no, the did, drums. The, the, the drum sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I called it eggs on a wall. It was like splat. Yeah, when I had, you don't have to apologize I, for that. I, 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 I agree. I agree, Mark. I agree. When I, I agree. when I used to play Candy O on a vinyl and I had, my father bought me a quadraphonic stereo system. Of course it wasn't, it was just four speakers playing the same thing. Mm-hmm. I used to think I always blew my speakers when I would play that. I'm like, Oh, I'm turning it too loud. It was just the drum sound. I actually read the technical <laughs> side of when he does that. It's, it's ultra compression. I mean, he just believes it. He, what he was doing was in the seventies, 
making stuff sound good in a car. That kind of got big yeah. in the 80s and 90s, but in the 70s, I think he was thinking yeah. along the lines of when you're outside, that that was his thought process. Good, good, point. good point. Yeah, Queen yeah. 2, play that on a big sound system. It sounds bad. It's ultra compressed, really bad. But the guy was able, to, if you ever read the backstory on um, on, on the Queen stuff with the, with the harmonies, Bohemian Rhapsody, I mean, what he did, he probably had a breakdown doing that because they were like, no, we got to do more, do more. And he was like bouncing down vocal tracks. So he's really good at what he does. He just, yeah. when it comes to loud instruments, they distort. That, that's so, all the compression comes in. I think when you're recording that many stacked vocal tracks and everything else, you got to keep the lids down. Otherwise, he's just, he said it's all blown all over the place. And then on top of that, you have all the vocals, but then you had the Brian May guitar orchestra. So you would have like eight guitars doing those, you know. Right. Oh, so sure. you had a lot of stuff being compressed. That, that yeah. Queen 2 album, uh, it's basically, if you watch it on UV meters, it was probably going like this the whole time, you know. Yeah, yeah. Was that a, that was at Trident Studios? Queen 2? I think so, yeah, yeah. They yeah. recorded their first two albums, three albums maybe, before they moved on, yeah. So anyway, I have some, I just have some albums that he recorded uh he did freeze fire and water the album with all right now he was actually wow. an engineer oh, really? on that he contributed okay. to production but he was an engineer he did the first two nazareth albums uh nazareth and exercises he did those queen albums he did a band i don't know if you guys know but bebop deluxe i like them future oh yeah heard yeah. of them couldn't tell you a song by them but i've read about them yeah pilot they, they toured with savoy brown Oh, hmm. opening acts. And they, yeah. And they covered a song called, uh, no, I'll say. <laughs> what? He, what? I was looking for that question of temperature. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he did the pilot album, Warren Heights. Remember Pilot? Yeah. Whoa, 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 yeah, I remember that, that song. Yeah. Wait a minute. So he was the Wasn't producer that produced by Glenn Johns? It says Pilot, Warren Heights. Uh, I'll and, do an easy G- fact check. Okay. <clears throat> I, I thought Glenn Johns produced Pilot or um, Ozark. No, he, he produced Jackie Blue by Ozark Man Devils. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. But they were uh, um, they were both engineers slash producers, correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think Glenn Johns was a little tougher than the other. <laughs> um, Ian Hunter, Overnight Angels. I just, not biggest Ian Hunter fan, but it's, you know, wide variety. So here's an album he did. He did Star Castle's Fountains of Light and Citadel. I wouldn't say go listen to Star Castle, but you should listen to them sometime on Spotify because they do sound like America's Yes. They really do. They just totally copied Yes. And either I've got Lou really thinking or he froze up. So, so they're American prog. They're an American prog band. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, he also did a Dusty Springfield album. I wonder if it was done at 914 Studios. I doubt it. <laughs> um, he did the Cars albums. He did two Journey albums, Infinity and Evolution. Very good albums. Did Head Games from Foreigner. That's my favorite Foreigner album. He was the producer on that? Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's got the same drum sound as Candio. Exact same drum sound. Eggshells. Alice Cooper, Flush of Fashion. That really wasn't that good an album. He worked on the heavy metal motion picture soundtrack. So this is where I was going. This guy had his hands in everything. He was he was there. He was around with all that stuff. Yeah, yep. He, oh, he did my favorite Cheap Trick album, One on One. And that's got the same drum sound. Bunny Carlos' sound on that sounds like what, Roger what, Taylor. What songs are on that, you know, on the Cheap Trick record? If You Want My Love, You've Got It, and um, oh, yeah, She's Tight. Around. Remember She's Tight? Sure yeah. do, yeah. Yeah. He did a Devo album, Oh No, It's Devo. He really? produced the Fast Times at Richmond High soundtrack. Now, we know that soundtrack had a lot of songs, like Tom Petty songs. I think he just oversaw the soundtrack, obviously. You know, get, get getting all yeah. the stuff. He did the first Motley Crue album, Too Fast for Love, which is a raw sounding, almost a punk album. And then I think back, I go, yeah, the drums, you know. Well, the, the tread lightly when you call Motley Crue a punk record. <laughs> punk, you know. Their first album was raw. It was raw. I mean, I do have a soft spot for it. It was really raw. He did a Slade album, and like, but that was '87, called "You Boys Make." Big noise. Okay. All right. Okay. And they probably spelled it, you know, N O I Z E or something. B O I Z. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. boys to men. I uh, did a couple Smashing Pumpkin albums. I didn't know the name, so I didn't write them really? down. Really? He did a Smashing Pumpkins record? Two. Two. Yeah. Wow. And then 
All right, this doesn't sound like the last album he produced is Yes, Heaven and Earth. It came out about six years ago. Now, that's not a big deal. You think, oh, why didn't he do a Yes album? It's Yes has a different singer now. But back in 77, he worked on an aborted album that Yes never finished. He actually worked with them in London for about five months, and things didn't work out. So all these years later, they come to him and they say, hey, can you do my album? You know, I guess it was kind of like a, a deserved thing for him. Like, yeah, I'm going to do a Yes album. And that album really does sound good. Sounds excellent. So, um, but he's still active technically. Um, he's working in film. All these guys do film. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of them, they, they, they do film. Yep. yep. That's where the money is. That's why Trevor Raven didn't do a solo album, the guitars from Yes for years. He says, I got like al- soundtracks set up for the next five years. And if you knew the money I made, I don't blame him, you know? So is it really always the- about the money or is it about the art? And the- uh, well, he did say in an interview, it is a lot of money. <laughs> He did say that. Wow. So now you know, that's think, commerce. Yeah. That, I yeah. mean, you know, Bon Jovi's about the money, you know, not yeah, about the art. Yeah. 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 Oh, we cannot, we can't say that name on that show, can we? No. What? <laughs> bon, bon Jovi? <laughs> Fuck Bon Jovi. <laughs> you know, you know who, who made the transition in my, I think the most successful rock artist that made the transition to scores, who? Mark Mothersburg. It seems like. And Danny yeah. Elfman, those two. Dan, Danny, Danny Elfman, Elfman. I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. Every freaking movie is Dan, still to this day. Danny well, Elfman, yeah, Danny Elfman. but the, the things that they do are interesting. Yeah. 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 Danny Danny has a very unique sound, very uh, intense. You know? And, you know, you know, also, when, when they do that, it doesn't mean that, you know, every song that's in the motion picture they're involved in, there's background music, there's transitional music, like Daniel Lenoir did in Sling Blade. You yeah. know the transitional music when you know when the, when he's just walking over the bridge. You know that's that that's transitional music. And I think you just reminded me. I think that soundtrack. I wouldn't listen to it on its own. That made the movie what it was because if you just saw it, it's a gritty movie in Texas, right? His music made it otherworldly in parts. That what great movie? sound? What movie? Sling Blade. Sling Blade. Oh, it's in Arkansas. Arkansas, sorry, yeah, I was yeah, yeah. but um, that that soundtrack, perfect example of how it sets the mood for a movie, you know? Yeah, yeah. And Billy Bob Thornton is actually from Arkansas too. Oh, he is. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. We can't go yeah. down that road because we start so, talking about that movie. <laughs> that movie. Yeah, I know we can go down that. <laughs> well, Lou's not here, but he would start doing his, uh, you know, Carl Carl Childers. Uh, I'm not allowed to do it. <laughs> I've been. His lawyer called me. He can't do it. Wow. Yeah, so uh, so Roy Thomas Baker is still working, as far as you know. Yeah, I think he is. It's weird. He's got a website that says Roy Thomas Baker Productions, but none of the links work. I know he hasn't died. Maybe he's just living comfortably, whatever, you know. Well, sure, uh, but so he did the first five Cars records. They stuck yep. with him for the first five records. He actually signed a deal with them that he, he had the confidence in them. Like they could have bombed and he'd still have to do those first albums. So you, you just, that that's amazing. Like, yeah, see, I'm did. curious as to where, where those, those cars records were recorded because I know they had their own studio in Boston, like synchro sound or something. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, I can tell you right now, I'm actually, I'm wrong. He only did the first four albums because that last album that they did that had like magic, remember those big hits? That was produced by yeah. Robert John Mutt Lang. So they went with the They you know, went the, plastic after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh all right, Candio, Cherokee and Hollywood. Cherokee Studios. First album is Air Studios in London. They went to London to record. For who went to London? Well, Cars. For their debut album? Yeah. Air Studios in London. Wow. Can- Candio's at uh, Cherokee Studios in Hollywood. Yeah. Panorama was Cherokee and the Power Station, all with Roy Thomas Baker. Power oh. Station, east or west? East, New York. And then, all right, so Shake It Up was recorded at Synchro Sound in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, that, that was their, their studio? That's their studio, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was the last time we did that. They built their own really studio after 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 they made a lot of money, and why not, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then Heartbeat City is the one that Mutt Lang 
but they recorded that one back in London. So they did some stuff in London. And something I just learned. The Cars had some. I mean, Elliot Easton and those guys. Like they, Elliot Easton's one of those guys, man. <laughs> He's just fabulous. You know what he inserts in these songs. Yeah. Um, the first album. There's a song on the first album that is a perfect. He puts a little country in his playing. He puts a little everything. Yeah. It's like an encyclopedia on how to do a thing. And the first to write album, I got, I got really tired of the first album, though, because it was <laughs> overkill. Yeah. It was overkill. It was just too, too much. You know, like, like you know how a, a hole in a hole in oats in the 80s, it was yeah. too much. Yeah. It, yeah. It was saturation. And, uh, but, you know, I, I have a little thing about uh, you, uh, you know, Bill Maher has a podcast that's called Club Random. I haven't heard and, it. I'm going to have to check it out. Yeah, and Daryl Hall was his guest uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago. And so, there, you know, Bill Maher, you know, he loves music too, and he's talking about Daryl Hall, and he's asking him about John Oates. And Daryl Hall was actually, like, adamant, like, almost angry, saying, like, John Hall is not my songwriting partner. He is not wow. my songwriting partner. And he was, he was getting annoyed. And he was saying things like, you know, I've written more songs with Sarah than I have with John. John John Oates is not my songwriting partner. Like, I don't know what happened if there's some bad blood or uh, whatever. But, you know, Sarah Smile, I guess that's the Sarah that he's talking about. Yeah. That he wrote a lot of songs with her, too. Because mm -hmm. I guess she's a lyricist and... uh but, you know, I was shocked at how angry he came off as to uh, John Oates is not my songwriting partner. I've seen okay. interviews with him. Hey, where he, he comes off very confident in himself, very confident. And rightfully so, he should be. But maybe they just had a falling out. They did tour. They not long ago, but, you know, you tour, you, you tour in the sell tickets. It's a job, you know. I understand, and maybe yeah. I'm wrong on this. John Oates was more of a production side of things. Um, uh, and, yeah, so. I don't know. I saw I saw a thing of John Oates doing you know doing a show somewhere, and on cable or YouTube or wherever I saw it, and like he's he was more Americana, more like that you know little bluesy mm. oriented as opposed to. Daryl Hall with the, you know, the blue eyed soul and it's always the blue eyed soul. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Daryl, Daryl tried in, he, in the seventies, he kind of tried to experiment with different directions. He did those, that Robert Fripp, uh, he sang on Robert Fripp's you, debut You've been album. telling me that he was the singer on Robert Fripp's solo album, right? And then his solo debut album, Sacred Songs, Daryl yeah. Hall's was produced by Robert Fripp. So he's, I, I what I got the gist of it was in the seventies he was trying to expand and the record company said whoa 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 get back and do what you do so he's in that you know he's the blue eyed soul guy and I guess he just accepted it. Wow, cool. Do you know who? Uh, do you know who Jay Bennett is? Jay Bennett was in Wilco. Hello. Hey. Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back, Lou. I was just, Lou, I was just asking Mark if he knows who Jay Bennett is. Jay Bennett, that's your accountant. No, no, he's not my accountant. You guys were talking amongst yourselves a whole bunch of shit, weren't you? <laughs> but nobody no, heard. Don't only, worry. Nobody were, heard. We were only out for five minutes. We were just, we were just that finishing five up. five minutes. On, we were finishing up on Roy Thomas Baker. Okay. Well, Actually, yeah. Lou, yeah. I did touch on the albums he he produced, and it's just wide range. Like you know, just, I, I, I just looked scope. up a lot of my, the Cars records, the, the Queen records. You know, when you mentioned the drum sounds, like I always thought the same thing. Um, I, I respect Queen. I like some of the songs, but I was never a big Queen junkie. But I, I always thought the drum sounds on that and on the Cars just sounded chunky. That just kind of like like meat, like almost. I don't. I like a nice warm thick. Tom Tom sound, but there was something just chunky yeah, about the drum yeah. sounds that no. I was like, you know, I mean, not nothing against the drummers or the, you know, right. the, the songs themselves, but, well, but throw, that's, you know, that's, that was his, yeah. like said, that was his idea to do things in yeah. car yeah. radios. Yeah. So, but, and throw, am, I up, am I up to speed now? 
You're yeah, up. yeah. Jim, Jim Keltner, yeah. And uh, the only other Jim thing Keltner. I said. What about Jim Keltner? No, I mean, Jim, that's a drum sound. Jim Keltner is a drum sound. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, well, Lou, no, sure. throw yeah. two other albums into that. Listen to Head Games from Foreigner and One on One by Cheap Trick. It's the exact same drum sound. Bunny Carlos had that drum sound on One on One. It's just did, a did very really? heavy drum sound, you know. Just um, in. W- when did they do One on One? That was 1982. That's my favorite Cheap Trick album. That has She's Tight and. Uh, if you want okay, my love, okay. you've got it. Yeah, and that, that's where Thomas Baker. What was the uh, the record you mentioned before that? Head Games from Farner. That's probably my favorite Farner album. He, he produced, produced that, that Farner got, record. Well, listen to the drum sounds. I, I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> so, what, what songs are in that? Um, I've been head waiting for a girl song? like you. No, no, no song, head games. It was a, head games. So, like Dirty had White Boy, Dirty White Boy, uh, Telephone, Love on the Telephone, and um, Rev on the something line. Rev huh. on, I can't remember. Right. It was a good, it's their heaviest album. They wanted to get, they just wanted to make a, a heavy album. Then it didn't sell. So then they went into. Oh, really? Pop, oh. You know? Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and the only know. other thing I mentioned was that uh, I had seen Daryl Hall on Bill Maher's podcast. And, and he was, Daryl Hall was kind of angry saying things like John Oates is not my songwriting partner. He is really? not my song. Yeah. He, he was. He was. He, he, this is what Daryl Hall was saying. He is not my songwriting partner. I've met, I've written more songs with Sarah than I have with John. So, like, he sounded kind of annoyed. There might be a lawsuit brewing that we don't know right. about. The, the, the Sarah he's talking about, there was a songwriting partner in a lot of their stuff. That was his girlfriend. Sarah, um, yeah, Sarah Smile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's well, written a lot. She's a lyricist, I, I assume. And uh, But he was adamant, like, John Oates is not my songwriting partner. Hmm. And he was like almost angry about it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'll have to check that out and listen. I, maybe there is, maybe there's some big lawsuit going on between royalty. Well, I don't something. know about that. He's just, you know, it's egos, man. You know? Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's acting a little snitty, you know? <laughs> well, Bill Clinton's so had out of people. He's getting snitty. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you guys want to, uh, Lou had mentioned about Dream Academy's first album. Yeah, the self-titled right? first album by the band Dream Academy. Yeah, correct the yeah. mundo. Let me see if I can locate something, Lou. Okay. This is them. I like that. I like what the timpanies or whatever yeah. sound that is. You know, it might yeah. just be the, you know, the floor tom or it, whatever. It's a, it's but it sounds like big. Tom it sounds very big. It's very Brian Wilson esque. It's very Beach Boys esque. You know, you can hear the yeah. tambourine right after that. Boom, boom. Yeah. It's it's. So what what do you know about that record, Lou? That you can uh, inform us and it, the listeners it's their about. First, it's their first record. Um, I think they formed in, in the late uh, in late nineteen seventies. They're English. Um. They formed, um, they, they were that they were together that long? Yeah, yeah. Um I don't know if they were called uh, the Dream Academy then. But um in any case, so but they wanted to create music that was not quite so much like the power pop of the time. They wanted to be mm-hmm. a little more symphonic using percussion, odd instruments, that kind of thing. You know, part of the instrumentation is um one of the uh the well the members of the band are Nick Laird Clowes, uh, the singer guitarist, Kate St. John multi instrumentalist. She plays the oboe and something called the Con Anglais, which is like an oboe. I think you hear that on a lot of those tracks. It almost yeah. sounds like it's very Beatlesque. And a guy named uh, Gilbert Gabriel was a keyboardist, so it was a three piece band. Um, but they wanted to you know, use synthesizers, odd instrumentation, not just be like a power pop band. Anyway, um, so they're on Warner Brothers Records. Uh, the singer guitar player happened to be friends with David Gilmore of Pink Floyd, who co produced this album. Uh, he played guitar on some of it, and he, he was co producer. and Played on some songs, wow. so yeah. Um, so, this, laughing another this, this town, debut album was nineteen eighty eighty five. Yeah, and uh, so the, the record itself was number seven on, on the Billboard charts. It was um, another that song, "Laughing in Northern Town," that you played was a number seven hit in the United States. That was and a big number. In the UK. I remember. It a, yeah, yeah oh, yep. it was a great song. I mean, yeah, first heard it. Um, it's dedicated to Nick Drake, the English musician. So that yeah, particular yep. song was dedicated to him. Um, and the album is pretty much it's uh, it was. The only really album that they did that people actually paid attention to. I think they did three records, kind of stopped, and they reformed here and there. But this was the record that was yeah. 
the one, you know, that it's, it's, um, I thought it was a one hit wonder. That's why I brought it up. Cause I thought not, lights on, um, life in a Northern town was her only hit, but they had a number. It, of, it is a one they, hit they, wonder. They, <clears throat> they never no, matched not, that. No, 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 but they cracked the top 40 with another song that's on this in record. the U S in the U S uh, yeah. A billboard hundred yeah. hundred. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it was a minor hit. I mean, well, is that a minor hit? I'm, who wouldn't want a 37 or whatever it was? Hey, top 40 is a hit. Yeah. 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 Um, so, um, you know, Life in Northern Ten. I love the song. It's just evocative. It's nostalgic. I, I, mean, I love everything about the song. I really do, Mark, too, Perry. Mark, yeah. how do you feel about do you think the it's, Life do, in do you think Northern Ten? Yeah. Perfect. When it's it came perfect. out, when it came out, I thought it was a. I thought they were a New England group. I thought it was singing about Vermont. So I was like, "This is cool" because I right. love Vermont. Mm-hmm. I had no idea they were English. And Lou, I had no idea David Gilmore that connection either. You know, I, yeah, I didn't so, know that yeah. until I looked. I up. didn't know that either. Yeah. The only thing that I didn't like about that, that video drove me crazy, was that old style of this. It was just like the the blurry vision and, you know, like you can't concentrate. Right. I don't and remember I grew it. up on MTV, so that's where I was seeing it. But the song, yeah. it would get in your head, and I, it's a great See, song. I've learned yeah. that, forget the imagery, just listen to it. And, yeah, uh-huh. it's a perfect dream pop song, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. yes. And perfect. If, if, if you really want to li- dig into the instrumentation, you know, you can – there's a whole bunch of stuff in it, just the way they layer it, yeah. and bring things yeah. in. Yeah. It's, it, Great it, vocal arrangements builds. and everything. Yeah. 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 Yep. Uh, that song took a year to record. Really? Yeah, they must have uh, loved that song. Imagine recording one song for a whole year. I'm like, I, just, I don't want to do it. That's yeah. probably well, the David Gilmore. Well, they were probably so jazz because <laughs> maybe they didn't have the time awesome. to go in there every day or something. <laughs> well, yeah, that that too. There's probably <laughs> tours and you know life. But, um, you know, hey, David Gilmore, thumbs up, man, if you had a lot to do with that, man, you know? Yeah, and as far as the production on the record, I, I mean, I really like it. We'll do an overview afterward. But, um, yeah, man, David Gilmore produced, I'm sure he produced more things than that. But it's that was yeah. a great production in and of itself. I, yeah. I heard 80s Pink Floyd in a lot of this this album. I heard some okay. of those effects, like the way he did uh, yeah. Momentary Lapse of Reason. I heard his, his, I could hear his influence on it. Yeah, mm, yeah. Cool, interesting. I bet. Yeah, what, well, what, that, that is a fabulous song. Yes, yeah. I said fabulous, fabulous. Mark. Yeah. Fabulous. And we we said that you remember years ago, Perry. You're like, we we talked about that song when it came out. You're like, that's a great, yeah, that's a great fucking song. Yeah, and, and also yeah. Lou, because you know that that brings you back. That song carries me to a certain time. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. You, yeah. you know that's what it is. That's yeah. the amazing thing about music. Mm-hmm. I have a quick I have a quick human interest story about that song. Yeah. Um, when I worked at the Hillsdale Bottle King, Mark, as a Hillsdale resident, you know, the railroad tracks that ran along that area. Okay, so I know it was the, like t- 19- the store, too. Okay, going into like 99, 2000, I don't know if you, as a resident, there's always this guy that would walk along the railroad tracks. He was evidently homeless, but he was well-built. Very, he was always tan. He always wore like tank tops in summer. Um, he yes. looked well-fed and clean-shaven. He'd always come in yeah. by a 12-pack, mind his own business, and leave. Uh, so one day he, he was talking, came in, he goes, that song was playing. He goes, I really like this song. And I'd have people come in and say, dude, where are you from? They, people would see him all the time, and, and they would question why he was there. So that, I, one time after hearing that, I said, my name's Lou. He goes, my name's Dennis. And the guy was homeless. He lived at the mm-hmm. Armenian home in Emerson. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting guy. He, was, he, went, he worked at the World Trade Center when the, the bombing hit, the first one, uh, and was it before the 9-11. He had a nervous yeah. breakdown, left society. He, that was and, like and early was the, 90s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he just left, but he lived as a subsidized homeless person at the armenian home anyway so wow. just get getting to know this guy we actually went out for a beer a couple of times it, and it, long story short he ended up getting his life back in order um good yeah cool. yeah yeah it got us yeah so but it was that that song was something him and i connected to so when yeah, we talked about yeah. that record I'm like his name was dennis but um cool little story i He'll saw him yeah. yeah i know who you, you know mean because i lived in westwood and i drive back and forth and the train line goes to westwood <laughs> yeah. he would always walk on the train tracks yeah 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 but yeah. you know he wasn't typically homeless he was he was Room. He was clean shaven. Yeah, and, yeah. But he's like, you know, the guy, yeah. the guy had a story to tell. Yeah. But that song that's, has that's a good. feeling. It was evocative for him. Yeah. Mm. That song is a perfect pop song. Life in yes. the Northern Town. Yep. Yes, yeah. I agree. Right. Mm-hmm. What else is on the record on there? The, uh, the, debut the second record? song is the second song is called "The Edge of Forever." Um, I never saw first really? day off, but it, it's in that movie. But when I heard the song, it's instantly recognizable. It wasn't a hit. Mm. Um. But uh, it's very 80s. Uh, it's a good song. I, I think, you know, it's an interesting record. It's 1985. There's a smack dab in the middle of the 80s. So there's a lot of, you know, all that modern pop and the beginning of synth pop and all that stuff was happening. Um, I may have a sample yeah. of it right here if you want to hang you on. Do. Okay. Yep. It's called Edge of Forever. Yeah, it's a perfect. The way we kiss 
That's Go a, away. This, this song has a great melody. Yeah. It's got a great melody yeah. And, yeah. and and great vocals. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. have the greatest this this guy that has a he knows how to sing these songs because he doesn't have a great range, but he knows how to use it in these songs. So there's nothing soaring you know, yeah. can be, be annoying but he, too. But it's the eighties. Oh, it's it's the eighties. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he oh, co wrote all the songs, so he wrote the songs to his voice. Let me just say, uh my notes for this album, the first time I listened to it, I was on my fifth Tito's and Club. So I was listening to it. I wasn't falling on the floor, but I was happily buzzed. I make them in small glasses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I made notes (laughs) while it was playing. Now, tonight, if you ask me, like, what do you think of the song? I've listened to it four times since, but I'm going to read my notes from when I had my 15,000 club because they are kind of funny. And it's true. I I was getting the album. (laughs) Gluten-free vodka. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That song, that song is typical 80s. I like it. It's got that. That drum sound, yeah. you know that, uh, yeah. You know why I like it? It's not over the top, though. You know why I like it? How well, do you feel My about note it? says, sounds like Howard Jones, and I loved Howard Jones in the 80s. It did yeah. remind me of Howard. It's typical uh, 80s, yep. And yeah. it's got a nice melody, and I did. I said, I know this song, and then I was reading up. It was in Ferris Bueller, and I, that's where I heard it. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I know it, uh, the notation I made was great melody and great vocals. And, yeah. And it, I it, it, double exclamation points. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was now. I happen, I happen to like the saxophone on this. I, I like the saxophone on this record. I mean, I, 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 I like I, the way it's placed in for an instrument yeah, I'm not I, fond of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yep. it, it was sax fatigue. You know what I mean? In the late seventies, yep. you know. Um, also, th- th- there should have been a major, major English pop hit. You know why? Why he sings the line "Go away"? He's, he's yeah. singing. That's the oh, criteria. Come on, they're British, man. They're yeah. British, but that's a criteria for an English that's pop. A, it's so a it's rite a, of passage. Yeah, I know, I know. So, so it's so valid, you know, just because of that alone, you know. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I read these songs and how much I liked them. This got a check, like I liked it. Um, Life in the Ten's got a check plus because I really liked it. But that's yeah. a that's a great song. Um, next song is called Johnny in parentheses New Light. That's Johnny, a Spanish yeah, style. yeah, yep. Interesting song. Um, there's a lot of drum programming on that one. Um, That's what oh, no, I the, thought. The, the, yeah. the song before that, though, "The Age of Forever." Did you hear the thunderstorm with the rain stick? Mm-hmm. No, no, no. <laughs> I, no. I, you throw, you throw on the headphones. Song. Yeah, yeah. The, I had it on Spotify. I was blasting it today. Um, you can hear like this rainstorm sounds, and they're using a rain stick so subtly. I mean, it's so freaking interesting. Really, a pretty rich record so far. Well, let me see um, if I can come up with this. Hold on, hang on one second. Again. I like the strumming on this. I was curious whether it was a Lind drum machine or if it was one of those drums that you used to have, Lou, in the 80s, those electronic drums. I don't think it was the Simmons kit because I had one of those. It's probably a Lind drum machine, right? Yeah, Yeah, it it sounds like a program. 1985, was it the Fairlight Music Computer? No, no, that's an actual computer that you could record on. Right, right. No, yeah. it, was, it was probably a Lindrum, some kind probably of Probably a Lind. It's yeah. definitely yep. programming. Yeah. Definitely programmed, but it's yeah. it's a nice song. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a like, nice it's song. It, there's not many up tempo songs on this record, so that's yeah. kind of an up tempo yeah. one. But um, I like the nice song. strumming I, on I, I gave that, that, was, that was a thumbs up for me. I do like this song. Yeah. My, yeah. my note me on too. that is yep. my note is dramatic, nice exclamation. Hear yeah. some Gilmore influence because I'm thinking of certain moments from Momentary Lapse of Reason that I heard in that. It's almost got like okay. that Pink Floyd epic. Yeah, 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 yep, de- definitely. Um, Great. Re- we'll yeah. go, to the, go to the next song. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that I listened to them in sequence. So just tell okay. me what you. Uh... Okay. So the next song was it's called um, "In Places on the Run." This to me was, yeah. was that a thumbs up plus. Um, the beginning sounds like the police is don't stand so close to me. It has this sort of ding 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 ding. Has this almost yeah, yeah. build up. Yeah, um, it's very uh, atmospheric. There's a, um, a lot, lot of percussion on it, which is interesting. Um, it sounds African. It sounds kind of African to me. Um, mm-hmm. But and then it goes straight pop into the you know the chorus and stuff. But yeah, yeah that was a good song. I, I, I like that one a lot. I, I it, wrote that it's a nice it's song and a melody, and I wrote with the sax also the yeah. saxophone in there. Yeah, and there's that oboe thing in there too. So that's part of their sound. It, well, you hear yeah. the well, record. you mentioned like their orchestration there, like orchestral. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's yeah. a particular instrument though that that they're using over and over again. That's that's yeah. Kate Saint uh, Kate Saint John. The uh, I I have a cut thing. Multi instrumentalist. 
Yeah, and I say love the woodwinds. So there's more than just yeah. a, like a couple. There's a few things going on. In yeah. There. Yep. That that well that that con Aguilar or whatever that thing was. It's a double reed woodwind or something. But that was one thing they wanted to use when they were forming the band. They wanted to use woodwinds and synths and things like that. So yeah. <clears throat> but uh, but when when I first heard that song, I said that was one of the songs. I said that's a crystallization of that sound that they had. It's mm-hmm. not the most standout. Yeah, it's, it's one of my my plus tracks. But it is a standout track. But um, yeah. Um, we, so now for me, the next two songs were a little bit of a bring down. The next two songs I think are kind of weak, or just not as memorable. Is it called so, This World? Uh, this Bound? World, yeah. This World and the sixth, uh, the other song called Bound to Be. They're good songs, but I do think they're not up to par with the other ones on the record. My well, opinion. You know, I don't have any comments on this world, so I must have just glossed over it. <laughs> well, what I wrote about it, this it, world okay. is... It's okay. It's okay. I, I wrote... I wrote. I like the chord changes on it. I thought it had uh, some nice okay. chord changes and a nice percussion and, a, and a, another saxophone again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, the song is about... He was worried about his friends becoming junkies. So mm-hmm. that's a lyrical theme to, to that. He was, you know, I guess... I, I, don't, I don't know where in England they were from or whatever. You know, that was 80, 85. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's always around. Yeah, um, yeah, but I guess he, he that was his like a cautionary song. But anyway, I, I don't. I think it was a, a almost like a not filler, but just a a, a place keeping song. I don't know. But well, for bound to be, well, I have Howard yeah. Jones again. Typical eighties. Definitely, but good. That's, I wrote that too, Mark. Yeah, but I also you know wrote. What I, I also wrote great bass line. Bound well, to here be. I yes, wrote I was. wrote funky bass and production. Dancy. That's funky. It is funky. Yeah. Now, one of my words I wrote, it could also be Kaja Gugu. Mm. Yeah, well, it was the I'm not trying to be too right? funny. I'm not trying to be too <laughs> funny. But I'm thinking... <clears throat> But just the, the vocal almost sounds like it almost sounds like it, it's got that. Yeah, it's it's, yep. it's, it's the second up tempo song on on the record. You know, it's like definitely a, a departure from the rest of the record. It's not as dreamy. It sounds um, like but, the beginning of side two to me. Like you okay. flip over the record. Yeah, you know? yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. Now yeah. this is one of the songs that I called that and the previous one. They were kind of little departures, but I don't think they're the stronger songs in the record. But um, I said the same thing, Mark. It sounds like Howard Jones. Mm. And that's not a bad, not a bad thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Howard yeah. Jones has some catchy songs actually. Oh uh, yeah. I thought yep. the intro was kind of ELO like. Mm. Yeah, a lot of influences yeah. in there. Yep. And that ba- mm. uh, that bass line. Well, I think there's two basses on the album of note, and I think it's Guy Pratt because he played with Pink Floyd and he had that slap thing going, okay. like the guy was, from Level was, 42. Was that the yeah. thumb thing? They're popping it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, and he. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Pino Palladino also played on it. He's the fretless guy. Yeah, he played on the firm, I, not the firm. Uh, I can't. Re- uh, uh, well, Pete Townsend, White City. He was played on the right. law firm. Right. Yep. yep. He's, yep. he's <laughs> also on this, uh, the Paul Young song, uh, come, come Back and Stay with For Good This Time. Yeah. Oh, bum, 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 bum. yeah. Great song. He, um, Sunset Grill. He's a, he's a bass player on Don Henley's Oh, Sunset is he really? Yeah. 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 Very haunting uh, he, sound, he was all, yeah. he was all, he was like the, um, the Omar Hakim or the Manu Kache of bass in the 80s. He was like on a lot of records. I saw him with Jimmy Page when Jimmy Page is on solo tour. He was really uh-huh. good. They just did. All right. Yeah. Pino Paladino. There's some interesting musicians on here. Oh, I forgot to mention some. Wait, we didn't get there yet, did we? No. No, we, we got, didn't. No, we, we didn't. Got, that was what? Bound okay. to be. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, um, uh, moving on, it was uh, that's the seventh song on the record, but that's the next one. Uh, on this one, at this point, I was like, I like the guy's voice, but I wanted to hear something different. I said, I'm getting, I'm getting a little fatigued with the guy's voice. But then the chorus comes in, all the other voices come in, and that, that thought went, went completely away. I said, okay. That, it just yeah. got rejuvenated for me. I, said, I was almost yeah. getting tired of that mid-delivery and yeah, then boom. It's that, interesting so. you said that because my note said good vocals and great backing vocals, too. Yeah, yep. yeah, yep. yeah. I got smooth 80s joint, 80s, very yeah, style exactly. council sounding. It, to me, it would sound huh. a little bit like style council. That, I, that, wrote, I wrote 80s with, yeah. a, with an exclamation yeah. point because it's I did typical too. 1980s. <laughs> yep. I did, yep. too. 80s bass. And it yeah. does sound like Style Council or, you know, I was a general sound back then, but uh, okay. very, I almost well, heard like a, an uh, L.A. California sound there for a bit. Mm. Um, maybe. Maybe not. 
<laughs> I said that. Same thing. I like the saxophone on it. There's one little weird thing in it. There's a percussion hit. It goes, it, it's almost disruptive to me. It's a, it, just scared the hell out of me. I'm sorry. Well, that's what it did to me. I was, I was, it was almost like digital <laughs> distortion. I'm like, whoa. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe the fair light tricked, uh, uh, you know, skipped or something. <laughs> Uh, I, I, well, I think if, if, they, if that's a remix that we heard in this record, I, if they remix that, if I was doing it, I would tone that, tone that thing down. It, it's almost like, like I said, it's, it did to me what I did to you there. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a little OCD, but what the fuck? When you're, yeah. when you're, when you're mastering, you got to be OCD. You got to hear every little awkward thing or whatever. I'm the one that mastered for... I don't know how many years. Mastered. True. I True. just said mastered, okay? Yeah, you have to obsess, right? <laughs> Those are the guys that come in after the fact. We don't do mixing. That's right. not mixing. That was a mixer. So what's the next? Love Parade? Uh, love Parade. The love, the love Parade. This was a thumbs up plus for me. Um, I like that Latin intro. Um, it, it, it's just um, it's very dancey. It's, and they thought, actually, this was the single. That was the second single from the record. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've with... got a sample if you want to let it ride. Yeah. Now I wrote, I wrote cute song, and I wrote like Roxy music, like I hear those yeah. things in there. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, that's definitely. I, I heard the same things in that. A, lot of, a couple of songs, Perry. Definitely in, in, in English Roxy music sound. Yep. Yep. Um, there's accordion on it too. It's kind of cool. There's some interesting sounds there, you know, but the lyrics are pretty saucy. You know, they deal with turn themes of adultery and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Other eroticisms, you know, it's like, it's, it, it, it's funny. This, this music, when it came out, I like lights in the Northern town. I wasn't into a lot of synth music back then. A lot of synth pop. I might've dismissed a lot of this going way back 85, however long ago that was. Yeah. And not now, not now at all. So I'm, I'm glad I kind of caught on to it. Um, it's it's so dream. That's a very dream pop song, though. Real dream. Pop. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna. Blow. I, I hear I hear the influence of this song and a lot of newer bands of the bedroom pop genre. Yeah, yeah. I, it, yeah. It, there's a certain like kind of loungy international sound to it. Um, you know, especially that Latin beginning, that kind of Latin beginning. It's very you know, it's international. You know, not necessarily now, world music, but international. Um, I'm gonna blow Perry's mind on this one. I have my notes. Good follow up single. Very British. Weakest song on the album. That's what I thought the first time I heard it. So I didn't think it was fabulous, Perry. And then only song not produced by Gilmore. And yes, it does sound different than the rest of the album. It's the po- it's the most popish song on the album. What the Love Parade? Yeah, that's the only one that he didn't wasn't involved with. So the obviously, door. it's like the record label said they, they that's a they wanted it to be a single, so they get another producer. Did the there. Doors have an album called Love Parade? Oh, oh yeah. Love Parade, uh, the Soft Parade. Oh, soft red. Okay, shows you what a big horse fan I am. Yeah, uh, she lives on Love Street. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good song. Yep. Yeah. Good. All right, so Love Parade. Yeah, I thought it was yeah. like Roxy music ish, and uh, yeah. all those influences there. That pretty yeah. cool. Yep. Now, th- there's a quote they use. I don't. There's a name for this. Is a lyrical quote when you take lyrics from another song and put it in. They keep yeah. saying, um, "This is dedicated to the one I love." They repeat that at the end. This is dedicated. Uh, however, <laughs> however, he sings it. Um, now, if they I, I, call this one, I call this one. I call this one Dream Pop Deluxe. I thought this was very, you know, very slick in a lot of ways. But I mean, the whole record's very warm and lush, though. The predictions, yeah. it's not eighties cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't like that eighties cold digital keyboard sound. Well, it's not, yeah, sounds really yeah. warm. Really, it sounds great today. I mean, this is yeah. Was it two thousand? It does. Yeah, and that yeah. song, Life in the Northern Town, is timeless, <clears throat> pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, what, Lou. If yeah. if they if the mamas and papas had done a Neil Sean and trademarked this is dedicated to oh, the yeah. one I love, they yeah. would have gotten some money out of it, you know. That's right. Yeah. They'd be getting paid now. <laughs> yeah. And Mark, um, don't believe that Neil Sean bit like, oh, they forced me to do like, yeah, he's the victim now. You see what I mean? Because hey, they, he's a guitar. Hey, he's a guitar player. He's I always playing take the, the guitar victim. Players. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd see you take Steve Perry's side. This blows my mind. Just and I'm sure, I'm sure they're all bro- they're all broke now too. You know, they are the poor over, guys. They're yeah. fighting over millions of dollars. Yeah. Like, this is they're sitting on top <laughs> yeah. of the giant pile. It's not, yeah. it's just not enough of it. <laughs> you know? So what's bucks. next? The, what's next? The party. Uh, next, next is my favorite song in the record. This got a check plus two thumbs up. 
only for the reason that Peter Buck plays guitar on it. Yeah. And David yeah. Gilmore. And it's um, called The Party. It's called The Party. The intro is great. Now, this is their, this is a Phil Spector, Hal Blaine, boom, boom, boom. The song, that's it's throughout a lot of the songs. Well, song let ones. me tell you so, what I wrote yeah, down. Cat, I wrote great yeah. production and I wrote Phil Spector. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It cast the nets with reverb. You yes. Know, that, well, so, let's give it a little great. run right here. Yeah, Hold man, on. do it. It's a great song. This should have been it's the second song. hit off the record. This should have been released after. This should have been the, the second hit. Or the second yeah, but single. This was the 80s. That wasn't hit single material. You know? I don't think it would have been a hit. I would have taken a chance on it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Well, I, agree. I, I might have said back then, you know, go for yeah. it. You give it if a shot. If you worked I, I don't A&R know. for Warner Brothers back then, you might have, yeah, talked him into it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They got fired. They got fired when it wasn't a hit. <laughs> They're now a where's, rack jobber at a record store. Where's Lou now? Well, he wanted yeah, right. that hit. <laughs> He's working on Sam Sam, the record man in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I've got listed up a next song called One Dream. Mm. One Dream. Yeah. One love, one life. One, one dream, dream yeah. right? Yeah. So let me give it a few seconds and see what uh, <laughs> see what the consensus is. Mm-hmm. Is one dream in my life, one that I love more, and settle down, fool around, games that only drag you down if you're blue. Now, what did you mm. guys? What did you guys write as far as uh... I got? Perfect last song, a la "Show Me the Way to Go Home." It's like the closing song. Huh. The bar is closing. There's you're the only oh, one yeah, left. Yeah. The guys at the piano. That's that's what I was thinking. You know? <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah. Great. Um, I wrote jab, jazzy, dreamy, and poppy. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the trumpet. I love the trumpet as an instrument. Um, the Latin guitar reminds me of Antonio Carlos Hobin with Sinatra, like the girl from Ipanema um wave all that stuff um very it's again it's kind of 50s like there's a certain ballad aspect to it i think it's a mm-hmm. cute little song mark i same thing i think it's a great way to end that record it's light yeah yeah, yeah. i wrote light. jazzy chords elvis costello and burt Bacharach. Mm. Wow. chord changes oh. you know and the melody yeah. lines yeah. and the yeah. trumpet very burt Bacharach ish yeah and elvis yeah. costello loves burt back he did a whole album yeah. of burt Bacharach songs right right that's right so yeah. I, that's what yeah. i caught in there yep all right. So that that's the record. Um so overview, what, so what do you guys think? Why don't you sum it up and then Mark will sum it okay. up and then I'll sum it up and uh, what's your overall um, view? Okay. I it took me for some reason it took me three listens to it and the third listen I'm like I I, I just listened to it. Yeah, you know, I wasn't maybe concentrating enough earlier. And I said this is a really great record. Um and it's it, the thing the the surprise and, and the delight for me was that it's a genre I don't normally really go toward. Um, mm-hmm. But having loved that, you know, Life in a Northern Town, I love that song. That is, like I said, that's a perfect friggin' song. It is perfect. I mean, perfect. not alone. And you, you, you can make it's your career perfect. on They made their career yeah. on that alone, and justifiably so. You can rest on that laurel. Um, mm-hmm. but, yeah. and, but on the last listen, I said, this is, a, I think it's a, I'll call it a great record in its own right, even though there's two songs I'm not crazy about. They're not bad songs. It wasn't like clunkers. They just it's just compared to weak. the rest of the yeah. album, which was so strong. Yeah. yeah. You thought the one song, Mark, you thought the one song was the weaker one. It's just a matter of, a, of opinion. Yeah. Um, but over, overall, I'm, I'm going to listen to the second record, but it's interesting because you know, the second and third record just didn't really, whatever happened or didn't happen there. So. They had a big name producer on the second record. I can't remember who it was, so it'll wow. obviously sound a little different. I'm going to listen yeah. to it, too. Okay. Yeah. So, Mark, but, how would you sum up the record? Uh, their debut okay, so album? my notes say very strong debut. Album flows as a song cycle. When I say that... There's certain groups that when they tour, they play their whole new album in its entirety. When I saw Boston on the third stage mm-hmm. tour, they did the whole album. This to me was like, it flowed. You could play this album song after song and it would make a good show. Um, it's a style. I'm very iffy on 80s. There's some 80s that I hate and there's 80s music that puts me back in that place. Howard Jones, me, me too. And this, me too. This, this was like yep. that. It opened up a whole new avenue to me. Like, I didn't know Dream Academy were like this. I just knew that one song. Didn't even know they were English. Yeah. I definitely, like I said, I heard the Gilmore influence. I have not I have a note that says, no live drums with a frown face. I miss live drums because I think I was on one of the songs that was just all the drum machines. But then later on, I say that 
Dave Maddox, who was yes. in Fairport Convention and just sort of talked. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yep. And then, like I said, uh, to me, some of the stuff reminded me of if it was Pink Floyd with that 80 sound. I, I know that David Gilmore had a big connection to pop. He loved pop music in the yeah, 80s. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was a, that was, you couldn't get much stronger. It's, it's a good statement from what's his name? Uh, the singer, like it's, it's a great statement from him. He came yeah. out of the gate, bam, you know? Yeah. So I liked it. I really his did. Name, his, name is, uh, his name was Nick, is, is Nick Laird Klaus. Okay. So yeah. And there was Katie St. Uh, Kate St. John and Gilbert Gabriel. Uh, keyboard. Mm. She, she played the oboe, the woodwind instruments, and he was a singer guitar player. Um, yeah. Now the songs were all written by him and the keyboarder. She didn't write any of the material. Right. But most of this, almost all the songs, except maybe one or one, maybe or two, was written the by. The second um, single was another guy. Uh, the the what was that? Yeah, yeah. The right. Love Parade. That was a whole nother. But all the others were by those two, I think. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I, I've only ever heard "Life in the Northern Town," the only yeah. song I ever heard, right. and I yeah. think it's a wonderful, wonderful record. I, okay. I, I think it's a wonderful record for a debut album. Um, I, I didn't know what the reaction was going to be because. You know, once I I listened to it the first the right way through, yeah. I'm like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I, I, I got to be more intense. But like, this is an interesting reaction. Yeah, well, like Mark said, you know, with the eight, some of the '80s stuff is a little iffy, you know. But oh yeah, this, yeah. this landed in there, you know, that dream pop. I mean, it's cool. just come on, man, you know. Yeah, dream pop. Yeah, so I think it's a great record. Uh, cool. Yep, it's just the yeah, records is called Dream Academy, right? Yeah, yeah. and Luke, group, you know, it's they, funny, and they only ever toured once. They made three yes. records. They only toured once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they yeah. didn't. It, it wasn't like a whole thing like that. It wasn't. A, yeah. it, it was a big push. The album was number twenty in the U.S. So, but I understand a number, a number twenty album and a, and a seven number seven hit single with. A I follow-up. understand they played on Saturday Night Live. So maybe on YouTube no you shit. can find. Yep, mm. Dream Academy oh, wow. on SNL. Yep, you might Love be to. able to find Love it. To. Yep, and you know they Luke, must like have you... played Live from the Northern Town yeah. on yeah. Uh, on Saturday Night Live. Yep, and you wow. told me it took you like a few listens. Well. When you hear yeah. anything buzz the first time, if if you like it at all, even if you don't know you like it, you like it because alcohol is yeah. a true serum. Then I listened to it like the next day at work, and I'm like, mm, I had a little trouble, and I had a mm. third time I really warmed up to it. So if I had <laughs> if I had listened to it like at work, read sober the Fuck first right. time, I would have been like, I got a drink. No, I got you know. But again, it's it's a multi layered production. Some of those yeah. things look the right. '80s Floyd albums, and you know. I, it took me, I didn't like them when they first came out. It took me a year to get into them. And then I loved them. Mm. 80s was a tough time for me. Some of the stuff just, yeah. you know, it's, I don't like drum machines, but I realize that some people can use drum machines the right way. Yeah. 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 They can. Uh, yeah. The same with a lot, a lot of the production, you know, the, the Prince records and just for example, other things, nothing against the music, the production, the sound of it coming at me. I'm just like, I don't like it, but you know, this having heard, you know, the, the, the song we all know, Life in Northern Town, it has that mm-hmm. warm sound, sounded great on the radio, mm-hmm. sounded great yeah. in the car. Still um, sounds great. <laughs> yeah. once, once I actually sat down and just chilled out and just listened to the whole thing, I was like, wow, this is a really rich, yeah. really rich record. You know? Yep. Yeah. But, and God yeah, bless the writers. David Gilmore, too. I am I I still hear that song on new TV shows, so that he's making money. And God mm-hmm. bless him for that. He did a good song. Yeah. He deserves to get the residuals okay. of that. That song was on King of the Hill. Guys, guys I just need a minute to load up some stuff. I'll be right back. I'm not. I'm, I'm still here, okay? Okay. Okay. Me and me and Lou are gonna have a uh, toilet humor now. Yeah. Did you hear the story yeah. of the CBGB bathroom? <laughs> I've seen. Have you ever been there? Were you ever there? <sighs> no, I never got CBGBs. I I went in. Uh, we we walked. I forget who I was with. We walked in for a few. Tried to get a. It was just. And I, I actually I looked at the bathroom. It was it was vile. <laughs> it was vile. Well, the Ritz wasn't much better. <laughs> um. The the, the, the old Ritz. Ritz or, the yeah. old Ritz. Okay. Yeah. I, I was never at the there. old Ritz. Now that was so when, when, how that's going back a bit. Well, uh, I uh, saw I saw a concert at the Old Ritz with Tom Spallone. We saw three. Three was Keith Emerson, Carl Palmer, and a guy named Robert Berry on bass and vocals. So it was basically at, ELP with wow. Greg Lake. Very at good album. Ritz. Very commercial. Very good album. Carl Palmer wow. does his drum solo, and he does this thing where he does the double basses while he's taking his shirt off and he starts hitting the guns. I've the seen double that. Double basses, see, yeah. They do that in Asia too. Yeah, so it's so the ba- the double bass is going, and so they had like these mirror tiles on the ceiling, and one of them fell and just left a huge gash in Tom's <laughs> chest. I'm like, Tom, are you going to sue the Ritz? Are you going to sue Keith Emerson or Cal Carl Palmer? <laughs> right. Wow. He kept the wow. tile, I think, too. You know, but that's that was right before it closed, so the place was okay. falling apart. You know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 
uh, uh, Perry and I, we, we went to the New Ritz, and so a camper von Beethoven with a couple of opening acts, but uh, I'd never been to the old. So we went to the one that we used, used to be Studio 54. Okay. Yeah. I never great went show. there. It yeah. was a great show. I mean, uh, camper von Beethoven, they, they were they were amazing. Uh, they're a big hit at the time. They, they On the album that they were touring behind, Key Lamb Pie, uh-huh. they did a cover of uh, Matchstick Men. Really? And yeah, I think it was a goof for them. It, it went on the record, but that was their that was their only really big hit they ever had. And it's a shame because the band was amazing. Hit? I'm just thinking there was another song from them that I saw on MTV. Well, the singer from the singer from Kemper, Kemper von Beethoven, he he started the band Cracker. So they had oh, uh, songs really? like they, they had songs like Low, Be, yeah. be With You Girl, Like Being Low, uh, yeah. Teen 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 Angst and stuff like that. That was he was in camera from made to him. I think the only hit, maybe Perry can verify, the only song that was considered a radio hit, was, like or maybe top forty, was uh, Magic Man. Maybe that's but what I'm thinking. Was of. what? Remember when we went to the uh, see Camper Van Beethoven at the the New Ritz? Yeah, the Studio Fifty Four. Yep. Yeah, they were touring behind Key Lime Pie, and and Matchstick Man was the hit from the record. And someone said, "Play Matchstick Man" or something, and David well, Lauer was like, "Oh, girl, fuck yourself." No, they were you know? they were play- <laughs> you know they were playing like. Uh, you know, songs that you and I love, Jack Ruby and all these kind of songs. They're, yeah, yeah, things from that and, album in and, particular. And the, the reaction, of course, from you and I was like, we're freaking loving this shit, man, you know? Great show, man. The yeah, crowd yeah. was subdued, but when they played yeah. Matchstick Men, then the crowd started howling because of okay. the cover song. Same thing I, like I, Los Lobos when they do La Bamba. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's a curse. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I thought Lowry made, made a pretty snide comment about something. Well, yeah. he had to, man. You know, yeah. like... Uh, like we didn't write the friggin' thing or something. Can I ask a uh, Can I ask a uh, music uh, relish um, question, like a test question? What was the name of uh, Camper Van Beethoven's first single? Uh, Take the Skinheads Bowling. Yeah, that's all. I love that title. <laughs> <laughs> yep, Th- that's a great album. Take the Skinheads Bowling. Take I gotta them hear that. Bowling. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Now their their earlier stuff is so much different than what they became. Almost like a prog band. Uh, Key Lamb Pie has got some. Interesting tunes on it. You know, a lot of straight ahead stuff, but there's some complexity there. But those first records are they're punky. They're they're kind of I'm gonna punky listen pop. to them. But here's punky another pop. one. All right, so David Lowry from Cracker. David Immergluck joined Counting Crows. Talk about really? mainstream. <laughs> what, wow. what, what did David Immergluck play? Was it Our beloved one? revolutionary sweethearts. Yeah. He's an American multi instrumentalist. That's all they say. Well, Perry, uh, that that record was a record before Key Lime Pie, I think, right? Uh, I think so. It, it, yeah. it had I uh, Fatima on it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Amongst others. So right. let me, uh, before we go into uh, Jesse Ed Davis, I set up all my uh, my lists on Jesse Ed Davis here. I just want to ask you guys a little trivia question. It's a, it's not really a trivia question. It's um. Can you name, you know, many people have sold millions upon millions of pounds. I'm sure the Beatles have sold a hundred million albums and, you know, all this stuff. There's three solo artists, solo, who have sold a hundred million albums. Three of them. Can you guys kind of guess and name them? Peter Frampton? Was he considered solo? Now think about this. Three solo artists who have sold a hundred million records. Hundred million, yeah. Want to think? Just think about it. No, this is no Jeopardy thing with any music or anything. Just give fill the dead thought. air while we think. A hundred, hundred million collectively. A yeah. hundred million records. Yeah, Paul solo McCartney. artist, not a band. Do you got one of them, Paul McCartney? I, that, I went there too, yep. Paul McCartney. Uh, yep. Frank Sinatra. Nope. Wah, wah, wah. Solo. Solo. Do, 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 do. I got that song in my head from Dream Academy. Peter Cetera. <laughs> no. Gene <laughs> Simmons. Let me fill in a little right. sound effect here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on cue. Do you want me to tell you another one? <laughs> Albert Bouchard. Uh, how about some no. I think that, you're that's gonna be, very wise. You're going to be like, very... oh, yeah, of course, Michael Jackson. Oh. Oh, fuck. Yeah, I didn't even yeah. think of that. And there's a third yeah. one now. There's a third one. A solo artist who has sold thinking, 100 million I'm, records. I'm thinking it's not modern rock or pop. I'm thinking it's someone <laughs> classic. 
So it's Paul McCartney, Michael Jackson, Julio Iglesias. No, he's oh wow. He I, well, if you want me to tell you, you just like, just cue me. You need a hint. I want a hint. Come on, throw me a lifeline. Oh, you want a hint? Sit back in your chair and impersonate the guy. Phil Collins. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh yeah. Phil Collins has sold a hundred million records. I yep. have sold Genesis. Not Genesis. Out by himself. Uh, yeah, yeah, he outsold Genesis. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Selling Genesis. By so the it's Paul pound. McCartney, Michael Jackson, and Phil Collins, three solo artists who have sold a wow. hundred million records. Yeah. Wow. I got one out of three. Yep. I got none out of three, just like on Scott McClain's show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I suck at tests. So, uh, so I wanted to go into Jesse Ed Davis, the uh, yeah. the Teach late me. great guitar player we're all familiar with, who is uh, a, se- a session guy, hmm. played on yep. many many records. I've got a list of lists of the records here he's played on, hmm. but you know he's from Norman, Oklahoma, born in 1944, Native Norman. American guitar player. They say yep. my right? sister so, lived yeah. in Norman. Oh yeah, huh. yeah, yeah. So the most boring town she ever lived in. And, I guess he's most famous for really being in Taj Mahal's band, right? And, you know, we've seen the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus. Yeah. Where, uh, yeah. like, oh, man, that is unbelievable with, with yeah. uh, Jesse Ed Davis yeah. uh, on there. Like, you know, his Telecaster, slightly out of tune. Mm-hmm. But it's like you mentioned played, that before, yeah. He plays like Robbie Robertson. They're te- it's texture. It's not yeah. just banging out chords or anything right, like right. that. They, you know, they they – Sit it in there, and uh, on 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 um, Taj Mahal's first album, they did Statesboro Blues, and Jesse Ed Davis played the slide, and this inspired Dwayne Allman to take up the slide guitar, the uh, wow. Taj Mahal's version of okay. Statesboro, Statesboro Blues with Jesse Ed Davis on I, guitar. I heard it. Yeah. yeah yep. Mm. Yeah, and he and he. Uh, He's he's made three solo albums. Also, he's he had now he was kind of like, uh, well, he, let me let me let me lead with this, Lou. He had Jesse Ed Davis. A lot of people knew him. He had two best friends in life. If you would say he had best friends, this may surprise you, may not. One of his best friends was Levon Helm. Yeah, and the other best friend was Gene Clark. My two idols <laughs> were his best friend. Yeah. yeah. In fact, wow, uh, Jesse Jesse Ed Davis produced one of Gene Clark's albums. I don't know if it was called White Light or No well, Other. But, uh, White White Light. Well, he played on both. Yeah, but he um, produced wow. one of them. Yeah. I didn't. Yep. I didn't know. I knew he produced. Yeah. They it. Were, wow. They, they were like best friends. Was he was best friends with Gene Clark and Levon Hell. Wow. Yep. And those those are also two great great records. Yeah, absolutely. The, great, the yep. great Gene Clark, the late great Gene Clark. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So, uh, here's some records that he played on. Uh, this is no, those. You know what? Before we even do that, yep, let's start seven. in like 1972, because okay. there's a little story about this song, right? So I, I got a personal story. About this. <laughs> well, hang on one second. I'm not telling it. I don't think we want to hear. <laughs> might. You might. It's too late for me. Jesse Ed Davis, guitar solo. Now, what's the personal story you have about uh, Doctor My Eyes? <laughs> now you're on teenage. the spot. <laughs> it's a teenage. It's a no. I can't do it. It's a teenage thing. All right, but Ball but this girl. this song here. <laughs> so this is this. I've heard. I've I've heard uh, Lee Sklar tell this yeah. story because he, he was a bass player on the song, and I've heard Jackson Brown. So Jesse Ed Davis comes into the studio, and Jackson Brown plays the track for him. He goes, Jesse, can you play on the song? He's Jesse says, I, I don't know. Have you got another? I don't think I can play anything on that one. Have you got another one? Cues up Dr. My Eyes. And Jesse says, yeah, I, I think I could do something on this one. Lee Sklar verifies this. First take is what you're hearing on the record. Yeah. 
And after after the, the, the after it was done, Jesse's like. Ah oh, no, I can do it again. Jackson <laughs> Brown is like, you don't understand. It's perfect. It's perfect. Mm. One take. Everything One you take, hear on yeah. there is first take. Jesse and David listening to it and playing it. Yep. Yeah. It, and there's other than it, that it, guitar solo. Excuse me. There's little textures in there that he, you know, that he yeah. puts in there. Like mm-hmm. first take. Yeah. Lee Sklar yeah. says says the same thing. He was amazed at uh mm. at it. Yep. And like you said, like and when he was playing with Taj Mahal and the rock and roll circus thing, he's playing textually. He's just you know he's supporting the singer, but yes, that guitar solo makes that song. Like you said, it, it's it, it's it's not sloppy, but it's very spare. It's just very rhythmic. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's oddly rhythmic, but a yeah. Great, great and it, solo, I don't think but... he played on the album. I think he only played on that cut. That, that oh, really? Single. really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yep. But no, that's he played. First, that's Jackson's first record. Yeah. 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 Well, this is too far away. Let me get this here. He played on Walls and Bridges. Right, John Lennon at maybe not his best. Whatever you think, but you know the song "Number Nine Dream." Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, and everyone thinks it's George Harrison going. Well, well, oh well. no, no, it's no. Jesse Ed Davis. That's Jesse Ed. That's wow. Jesse Ed Davis. Yep. Mm-hmm. On that track, John Lennon plays acoustic guitar. Klaus Vorman plays bass. Jim Keltner is playing drums. Yeah. Wow. Bobby yep. Keys plays the saxophone. Jesse Ed Davis plays the electric guitar. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people used to think that it was Yoko going, John, it's May Pang. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's okay. May, because this was this nice. is when he was in L.A. doing that. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Yeah. I think, yeah. So that was his lost weekend. Yeah. So yeah. Those, those Lennon singles, like Number Nine Dream, um, Mind Games, um, they're great singles. You know, some of the albums weren't always that compelling, but that, you know, like whatever gets you through the night, that's on Walls and Bridges. Uh, that was the number one hit. But yeah, the albums yeah. themselves, you know, they're they're okay. But I, I just don't think they were. I don't think Lennon was at his best without yeah, the Beatles. No, I'm just saying that on, but, on, on yeah. number nine, Jim. People used to always think it was George Harrison right. because there's a little slide in there. I it's did. Just, it's just yeah. the right. George wow. Harrison's not even on the track. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. You taught me something. Yeah. Gee. Yeah. Well, he, so, he also he he played with all the ex Beatles too. He played on uh, he played on Ringo's Good Night Vienna. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. He played on uh, John Lennon's Rock and Roll album. 1975. Yeah, he played on Rod Stewart's Atlantic Crossing. Uh, that's the where I was saying. Remember, I told you, Perry. I said he played on something. He was on Atlantic Crossing and The Night on the Town. Two of his best. And he albums. played. I'm um, get. Yeah, I'm getting to that. He played on Sorry. Atlantic Crossing at 75. Then yeah. he played on George Harrison's Extra Texture. Hmm. Yeah. He played on John Lennon's album 75, Shaved Fish. No, was that a Morris Levy uh, obligation? No, that was rock and roll. Was the Morris Levy obligation? What, what was on yeah. Shaved Fish? I think that that was a collection. I don't you think that guys are gonna have album. to look that up, man. But Jesse yeah. Davis is on guitar. I'm on it. Then he played on Ringo's "Blast from Your Past," another Ringo album. Then he played on Rod Stewart '76 "Night on the Town." Mm. Yep. And, and uh, on the town, did, did he play on "Tonight's the Night"? I, he, I, well, there were a lot of guitar players on there, but. It could be him going, bam, 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 bam. you know, it right. could be Jesse huh. Davis. Yeah. yeah. Could very well be Jesse Davis. Power to the people, right? Man, power to Jim yeah. Gordon is a drummer on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Shades uh, Fish was a compilation album. Yeah. Okay. And um, so. Did, did, did you mention the concert for Bangladesh? But he was the guy. He was the guy. I was just gonna. Yeah, he was the guy because they weren't sure if Clapton was gonna show. And, oh God! Uh, yeah, they needed another uh, another guitar player because Clapton, Clapton was out Clapton in the alley. Was, he was strung he was out. The, he was yeah. on the junk then. Yeah. And then he, even when they had him there, he was going out in the alley and scoring heroin. <laughs> God, yeah. he was well, strung out. We, yeah. we should we should touch upon that subject in a minute too. What? Well, the junk. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm good. That's how how it ended, actually. Yeah. So, so, uh, you you know you remember that remember that uh, remember that Ringo song on one of his albums, "I Am the Greatest." John Lennon yeah. wrote the song. When I was a little boy, way down in Liverpool, there's three Beatles playing on that separately. Wow. No, all together, all in the studio. No. Ringo, no, John, no, no, and George. Ringo, Ringo, John. Okay, Paul was yeah. in there. Okay. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> three Beatles on that song. Might have been the first time three Beatles were on a song together. I think, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, th- I think some of those things, there's a couple of them that were on individually. 
You know, yeah, some, George yeah, worked with yeah. John Lennon, and you know, and yeah. you know, they all remained friends. But Paul is always the outsider for some reason. Like he didn't, Paul, yeah, he didn't work with Jesse Ed Davis. You know, when Paul did the kazoo on or the kazoo sound, and you were sixteen, was he the only one there? Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, um, so and what happened was uh, in 1988. Jesse Ed Davis was, um, he also played on Clapton's No Reason to Cry. Good album. That record, yeah. Huh. That had the band, most, a lot of the guys in the band on that album. Yeah, well, that's that Robbie Robertson sort of thing. Like, these guys are very similar in the way they yeah. play. He was devastated, apparently, when John Lennon got killed. Devastated. Mm. He was never the same after that. Mm -hmm. right. Because he was on Double Fantasy, Jesse Ed Davis, right? He was on. On Double Fantasy? Yeah, Jesse Ed Davis, I believe, was on Double Fantasy, one of the guitar players. Yep. Huh. Yep. But anyway, in uh, 1988, he's in his laundry room at his apartment building in Venice, California. He collapsed and died. And they found fresh track marks on his arms. Uh. And uh, police said it was an overdose. Yep. And he was, what, 44 years old, I think, right? Still Born in 44. He was 43, depending on the month. Yeah, he was 43. Yep. Mm. Jesse Ed Davis. Uh, of course, he's in the uh, Native American Music Hall of Fame yeah. and a couple other halls of fame. But, uh, yeah, Jesse Ed Davis. What a body of work this guy left behind, you know? He's, he's still pretty obscure, you know, obscure, you know, unless you're into the yeah. nuts and bolts of it. But, like you said, like, people thought that was George Harrison playing, and that was not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other, other things, too. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, he, you know, his yeah. friends with uh, Gene Clark and Jesse Ed Davis, he had three. He made a, a record called Jesse Davis. He made a record called Ululu, and then he had another record in 71, 72, 73. Like Gene Clark, they didn't sell. Yeah. But they they were happy making them. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, they made the records that they wanted to make. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So, well, back then you could have an A and R guy, you know. Speaking of which, that really believed in you, that would just go to a record company and say, "Hey, let's, let's give this guy a shot, give this band a shot, give her a shot. Something's yeah. going to happen." Yep. It yep. may not take the first record or whatever, but um, yeah, you know. But even back then too, yeah. the, the record business wasn't. It was big, but it wasn't as big as it is now. So you could be a marginally selling artist. You're just not part of the main yeah. roster. You know, you don't get dropped, even though you're not selling. Yeah. Millions and you know when he was you're, working you're adding in LA, to the overall profit margin, you know. Yeah, he'd get triple scale. He would get triple scale. Oh, wow. for, yeah. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's it's how yeah. in demand he was. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Jesse Ed Davis. Yep. Yeah. And now he's in that documentary Rumble. Because Is he? Link yeah. Ray, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you, you know, it was about the Native American musicians, Link Ray, and such. Right. Uh, yeah. Did you? Uh, did I, Lou? I told you. I mentioned to you guys. I think I mentioned to Mark while you're, uh, while you were, uh, you were out. Is that the? There was a documentary I saw. Where, where are you, Jay Bennett? Oh yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know we know who Jay Bennett is, right? He used to be in Wilco. Yeah. And uh, yep. And we all saw his firing in that movie. Well, see, <laughs> I'm there's trying to break the thing. Heart. Yeah. This this documentary, kind of, kind of tells you about a little more things about like editing. In other words, you remember in the movie I'm Trying to Break Your Heart where where Jeff and Jay are arguing over something, right? They're arguing over, like, yeah. um, one of the songs where the noise comes in and we want it to, you know. Uh, heavy Metal Drummer, weren't the they lead, The lead that? into yeah. Heavy Metal Drummer. Yeah. Okay. And, <clears throat> you know, and, and, and they're and having on. an argument, and then they cut, and then you see Jeff vomiting in the toilet yeah. <laughs> and and what the editing makes you believe is that they had an argument and then jeff yeah. jay, jay was so upset or jeff was so upset he went to vomit oh, he had a the vomiting scene was two days prior to that so this wow. is the editing um, yeah. you know a, a, a twitty head or hopefully he doesn't have a migraines yeah so he was having a migraine headache and that can make you vomit right uh, i know that, I that, why, why, why did i have to add that what was it not as dramatic well they cut they, it they, yeah well yeah, but that was that was meant to add drama. Come on, that's that's, that's absolutely. a absolutely. It was meant to add drama. They made it look like because of the argument. Yeah, Jeff it had made, to go vomit. Yeah, it made Tweety look like the reluctant leader. Or like, Jay I don't gave me a, Jay charge. gave me a migraine. Yeah, yeah. Or Jay yeah. got me nervous. I don't like yeah. arguing. Made it. Yeah, and, maybe because he was smoking in the studio all the time. 
<laughs> Always. That'll trigger migraines. Always. Oh, and, and I would die. I would die. So I have I have the uh, Bennett and uh, Bennett and Birch. I have that record. It was I, what was it called like the Palace at Midnight or uh, you gave me some, a copy of it. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it's a good record. Mm-hmm. But also, you'll remember from the from the documentary on trying to break your heart. They made it seem like he went from Wilco to like playing in a bar for eight yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. place was full. Mm. The, the place that they played was full. Yeah. It was completely full, but you didn't think that the way it was shot. Yeah. So it, it, look, it, it looked like he was going back to the basics. Correct. And, you know, and he was going, playing oh, no. to a full house. Yeah. They I were playing for a full house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> full house. And um, he died from fentanyl. He died back from then? fentanyl. He had, here's what happened. He had, uh, yeah. he needed a hip replacement. Yeah. And I guess the pain was so much, he was putting on fentanyl patches. And wow. they said one of the pe- fentanyl patches was faulty. And we, I, he, he might have put on multiple fentanyl patches. I don't know. Probably, yeah. You know, yeah, that the pain was so probably. intense. But do Jeez. not mess with fentanyl, man. Um, <laughs> like, I've yeah. used fentanyl patches for my back. <laughs> really? Don't. I'm not using don't. them anymore. No, but years ago. Years ago. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not now. No, my thing with Get a lidocaine having... patch, man. Don't do fentanyl. Oh, yeah, it was lidocaine. I'm sorry. I'm so done with these drugs, you know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, pl- I'm playing devil's advocate for a second. Musicians that don't have health insurance. They, now, it, was told, I, I, well, it was told it was a pre-existing condition, so I, I know, it but, wouldn't well, cover it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think if he had coverage all along, it happens. But I, I read about a lot of musician, musicians that don't have health insurance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's the Affordable Care Act. Are you that? Are you making records and you're that destitute? Because I mean, I've never been in. I won't. Of course, money goes. I, mean, I I pay for my own health insurance, and I'm not a wealthy man. Yeah. You know, are they are they yeah. making that little less than me? Or so where are they living? I wonder if it's just the fact that they just don't do it. I think Jay Bennett really. Well, didn't this make was much 2000. Money, you know, I don't know if I'll, if uh, there was. I, any I can't health. believe he went from. I can't believe he went from Wilco playing on those those first three records or four whatever. And then not doing it, he couldn't afford a two hundred dollar a month health insurance policy. I don't know. Well, I'm not saying he couldn't. I, I don't well, re- you know what though? The hip replacement. If you have bare bones insurance, that hip replacement might have put him under financially. That's a yeah, big I'm not, operation. I'm, I'm not yeah. saying. I'm not saying that either. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I don't know. There might not have been a health care. You know, there might not have been. You know, the Affordable Care Act back then. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. there wasn't. It wasn't. That was back in the early '90s, right? Or was mid there, '90s. Well, yeah, yeah. when was he let go of, of Wilco? That, that was the um, two thousand one. Oh, Yankee that Hotel late. Fox okay. record. Yeah, yeah that's that was when, that's when Yankee Hotel Fox was right. Uh, but this was all yeah. pre. Yeah, this was all pre that uh, healthcare thing. So right. yeah, it's you were on yep. your own. I I did too. I I did the Cobra where I had to pay my own health insurance. Yeah, it was yeah. a lot. Two thousand a month. You know. Well, anyway, fentanyl killed him. It wasn't smoke. It wasn't the carton of cigarettes a day that killed him. It was the. Uh, it was a fentanyl patch or faulty fentanyl patch or multiple fentanyl patches. I, re- I remember, Perry, I came into the laundromat one time and you went, yo, Jay Bennett died. I was I was shocked. Yeah, I was like, whoa, mm. Jay Bennett died, you know? Yeah. Well, I have that record by Bennett and Birch, and uh, it's a pretty good record, I have to say. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very produced. Like he was getting, like yeah. he was doing what he wanted because it was always in, in Woco. He wanted that sound, but he was always button heads with Tweety. So on this album, you know, it was his production. It's what he wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. Well, you, you can see in the movie, too, or he's going through the sound checks before the gigs and they're checking. Well, maybe, yeah, you know, yeah. maybe did he take what it upon that? himself? Maybe maybe he had to do that. What was you that know? thing where Tweety said they're in the lim- they're in the limo and Tweety goes, Bennett's at the, uh, at the venue already or he's up there already playing or yeah. something? Yeah. 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 And then there's the part where Bennett says, a newsflash or whatever. Jeff is on the way, or Jeff Lee's on the way. Or there's some kind of. There they were no, going at each other. Yeah, no, yeah, they, they, they were. were they were up in the loft or something, and Jeff rings the uh, Jeff, you know, rings the bell. You know, I guess it's secure. You have to get in, and uh, it's like, oh, Jeff is here. Well, notify the press, Jay Ben says. <laughs> yeah, yeah, know? yeah. Well, you know what? Guess his name is on the recording contract, Jeff Tweedy. <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, that, that's yeah. 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 I got to give myself this. I just what did you just, do wrong? I just I just talked about two guys that died, man. Jesse and Davis. <laughs> uh, and Jay Bennett, man. Let's, let's pick this up, man. 
Mark, All let's right. pick this up. Let's go. Okay, so listen. Let- two th- I got two things for you. I'm going to pick it up because I'm going to recommend an album for you guys to listen to. Okay. And I know you know the artist. Perry, I'm almost positive you've heard the CD. Lou, tell me right off the bat if you've heard it, and I'll change it. But I'm going to recommend Wildwood from Paul Weller. No, I don't. Okay, awesome. And, and Lou, all I'm going to tell you is this. The drums. Just giving you a little of your candy there. Okay, the all right. Okay, now, and that's all I'm going to say. The drums are fabulous. Is it called Wild Ones? <laughs> uh, Wild Wood. It was Wild his second Wood. solo album after he left Style Council. I'm a fan. Wild Wood. I can't Wild remember hearing Wood. that one, so I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Yep. Now, cool. listen, guys, if either of you listen to it on Spotify, just so you, they got the deluxe edition, you'll be sitting there for two hours. Stop listening after the song Hung Up. That's the last song on the proper album. Okay. Because after that, you okay. got like a whole other hour of B sides, and don't yeah. don't put yourself through that. Just go. I'll tell you. After you don't that. have to worry about me. I don't okay. listen on Spotify. <laughs> I will. I will. So I will take that into consideration. Yeah. Hung um, up. But but we're not done. We're not done for tonight. No, we've no. got Mark's album reveal. That's right. That's right. Well, well, we we actually, we, no, I, oh. no, yeah, I have something to do before Mark's album. You've reveal, got another one hit wonder. No, well, I do. I'm, I'm going to wait. I just have a little, a little tidbit. Okay. There's some. It, it's music fluff. Do we have any? Do we have any music fluff music? Music relative fluff. Uh, wait. Music fluff music. Yeah. And now music fluff with Lou Calicchio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bingo. Uh, I'm going to have to cue this up. Hang on a second. Music fluff. All right. Talk amongst yourself for a minute. Oh, I should unmute You're... my mic. <laughs> you should unmute your mic. Yes, yeah, You could have had the sound of wine pouring. <laughs> yeah, talk, talk amongst yourself. Oh, my guitar is out of tune. <laughs> oh. Where, where's that little guitar, man? Show me that little guitar. Oh, yeah, well, unfortunately, people hearing it won't see it, but I got eh, goodwill. At goodwill, this tiny little guitar in a case, and I could be like Alex Lyson. Oh. I can take the guitar and I can play. I, I have it. Oh, okay, because I thought I'd have to play a song on it. Thank God. I was going to play something by the Beatles. Things tonight. You're on fucking notice, John. I gave you a list. That half a list that I gave you was choosing everything on it. What was Uh-oh. that? He what froze. Was that? He froze. What was that, man? <laughs> It sounded very familiar. It sounds it like sounded Joe extreme. Pesci or something. Uh, I'm thinking the thing that you do, maybe? Nah. It's one of those music movies, fiction. You know, that, that thing that with the band? Uh, yeah. The yeah, Wonders? Yeah. Might have been. No, we would have heard Tom Hanks. He'll be back on in a few minutes. Give him, he'll be right back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to uh, start your reveal? Ah, well, I'll have both of you on. So let, let's just mention one other thing. We should touch base. Lou said something in a future show. He says he's rebooting. Yeah. Okay. Oh, heroin. We really should touch on what it's done to music. And who has escaped it miraculously and who and like how many lives. If someone's 80 years old, that's one thing. But you got Jesse Ed Davis was 44 when he died. 43. 43. 43, yeah. Damn, you know. Even, and not just heroin. The hard drugs, you know, not weed, but John John Endersol, cocaine, all that stuff, you know. Well, but. I've got to tell you, and this is this is the honest truth. Never yeah. ever once did I ever sniff cocaine. Me neither. Never took pills. Never took. I never took acid. I never did anything like that. I'm but scared to do acid. The that only was- thing I ever did was smoke weed. That was it. Same here. That yeah. was the worst thing I ever did. I can't I, even. What's what's that drug that they give you when you come out of an operation? One of the drugs for pain. It makes me vomit. Oh, I can't. I can't like, and people get hooked on it like crazy. And uh, but then I've taken Percocets, and the whole day goes by. I can't be like that, you know. Yeah, I was always afraid Alcohol. of drugs. I was always afraid of drugs. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. One of these days, they're going to make wine legal. I hope they do. 
because you know. What do you mean it's legal? I got a doctor's note to drink my wine. I got the card. They tax it, yeah. <laughs> well, if he's rebooting, that might be a little while. But why? Yeah, give him a... yeah why don't you start with your album reveal? And uh... okay, we're going to talk lengthily about. It. <laughs> All right, the first album. Pulled this out. You what see is Ralph it? Macchio with a blues man? The soundtrack to Crossroads. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. say what you want about the movie. The soundtrack was the movie well sucked. done. The movie sucked. I kind of softened up on it through the years. I don't know. You know why? Okay. Because because you can tell he didn't really know how to play guitar. You, you know what, though? He learned yeah. enough to look like he was playing. No, not but, to me. Not to me. Yeah, well, you're, we're yeah. guitarists, you know. Yeah. But the thing about the soundtrack, produced by Ry Cooter. Yeah. Uh, most songs, Jim Keltner on the drums and uh, Ry Cooter, of course. And the album, I thought it would have the guitar duel at the end. It didn't. It just had all the typical blues songs. Very good album. Very, very well, good. Well, Steve Vai played like the fiendish, devilish guitar. That was great. Uh, right? Yep. Yeah. And he did, I think he did Ralph Macchio's part. I could be wrong on that. So, what, do you, what do you mean? Um, he, uh, he, you know, when Ralph Macchio oh, was playing. Oh, you mean he was actually playing it? I when, th- or it may when have been Ralph him. Macchio was badly acting like he knew how to play the guitar. <laughs> Incidentally, I. Hell, I'm the blues. He's from Long Island. <laughs> I like when he's in the, the nursing home with the old guy and he goes, you call yourself a blues man? You ain't no blues man. <laughs> I'm the blues. He's from Long Island. <laughs> um, Yeah. It's, it, you know, uh, like I said, the music, the work that went into this the album yeah, is, yep. is top notch. So, oh, he was on Mark Marin's show last week and he said that they let him, Ralph Macchio, yeah. they let him keep the Telecaster he used in the movie. Wow. And, you know, Mark had to say, do you play? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, who knows you know, if he does or not. So, all right. Next one. Pink Floyd, a nice pair. Unfortunately, I'm showing a naked woman's top on it, but this is a, and I'm, I'm kind of cheating here. Only because you said album. So this is that a the repackaging. back cover or the front cover. That's the front cover. Wow. And it had a sticker over this. Uh, it's basically just after they got big with, Dark Side of the Moon, they re-released the first two albums with Sid Barrett. And oh, it's got okay. a lot of pictures and stuff. But it counts as an album. This is how I learned about Sid Barrett. Yeah, but I that was that's really yeah, because Animals was out no. Wish You Were Here was after Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah, yeah. So it was around that time. So, you know, Capital was just like trying to get everything out yeah, there. Yep. You know. Unfortunately, people that like Dark Side of the Moon in America may not have liked these albums. I hated them when I first heard them, but now I like them. They're just too esoteric for me. Okay, you may or may not know this one. UFO, Strangers in the Night, live album from 1978, I believe. Don't know anything about them. UFO had... Are uh, they German? No, English, but they had Michael Schenker in their band. He joined them when he left... uh, scorpions oh okay they were a great band they were the they were the basically the rolling stones of hard rock because they drank a lot did a lot of drugs and just they're still torn and two of the guys died on the road so (laughs) a good good band uh very basic hard rock not heavy metal at all hard rock prog the yes album now I now that I've seen that many 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 times. Yeah, this scared record. the hell out of me when I was five years old. I saw it in my sister's collection. There's a head. It scared the hell out of me. This is what's, this is what's on that record. This is the Wait game a minute, changer. There's, there's only four guys there. Well, you got um. Wait, oh, don't, don't tell me. Let me guess. Let me see. Let go, hold it up. Let me see who they are. My finger. John, Who's that? John, as, I can't tell. It's too far away. But there's John Anderson. Chris Squire. That's Chris Squire. Rick Wakeman. No, that's John Anderson down there. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. That's John Anderson. I'm sorry. Yeah, John Anderson. That's Tony K, the keyboardist before. Oh, Rick Wakeman wasn't he on wasn't that one. He wasn't in the band yeah. yet. And that's a fresh new member of the band, Steve Howe. That's, he just joined the band. That's their first album? No. They did a few albums with Peter Banks on guitar. And then... They were kind of like in trouble with Atlantic Records. Yeah. So they kind of told them, get your shit together. You got to do an album. So they this album was a was a game changer for them. It what's, has, what, what's on that record? Because I've seen that at everybody's house that we hung out at, smoking well, weed. Uh, I've seen All Good People. You know that tune. 
Know that song well, yeah. All good pe- all right. yeah, yeah. Uh, Yours is no disgrace. The one that goes dun 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 dun. Big song. Yep. The clap, which is Steve Howe's solo acoustic thing, that's a little bit bluegrass. It's it's a fascinating song. Yeah, he's a jazzy guy too. <clears throat> yeah, he is. Yeah. He's more jazz than rock, in my opinion. Um, and perpetual change, which is a deep cut, but big. And like we said last week. Oh, they got the albums on the inside. All the Atlantic record albums. Yeah, I see. <laughs> what do I see? Goat's Head Soup there or something? Last Clown. Yep. George Carlin, Yes Songs. Yeah, Goat's Head Soup, Jay yep. Giles Band. Yeah. I see Houses of the Holy, Led Zeppelin oh, yeah. in there, right? Yep. Yeah, that pornographic cover. Yeah. Sticky Fingers, Layla, Bette Midler. Yeah. This stuff. Oh, and this. I have this album. This is a... I know, you know, this is actually pretty good because it's got a lot of deep cuts he did with, like, other blues guys What is it? Stuff. History of Eric Clapton. Oh. Very good album. I like collector stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, that was their – because after this, they did uh, Fragile with Roundabout. So this is the album that launched them. That was the – that was the first thing I ever heard by, uh, by Yes on the radio yeah. hanging out was seen Roundabout. Good people? No, oh, Roundabout, yeah. Same here, same here. Now, I randomly picked these, so uh, I picked out another classic, and I love every song on it. Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road. Oh, man. Whoa. And I'm going to move my microphone over because this is an example of why I love albums. The packaging. I'm opening it up. Yeah. You got all the all the lyrics have pictures, you know. Yeah. You the picture of the band. But then... It opens up three ways. I mean, it's a masterpiece. Yeah, See? but back then, art, artistic, artistic meant so much back then. Yeah. You know? Then it yep. became, you know, th- you know, this was before it became the simple thing with the mylar sleeve for the record and all that. Oh crap. yeah. This yeah. was art, man. It was art everywhere. It was art every, all the way around. Not just the recording. It was the photographer. The you know the oh man. Yeah. So like, what's, on, say, what's on? What's on? I would sit in my room that and I would listen to the songs and follow the lyrics, like Benny and the Jets. That was a rock video Ooh. of the '70s for me. Just looking at that. You know? Yeah, that uh, was great. Uh, when I was a kid, "Funeral for a Friend" scared the shit out of me. The, the sound, of yeah. the, the, the it really freaked me out. I would tell my sister, "Turn it off, turn it off." So "Funeral for a Friend's on it. "Love Lies Bleeding Apart," but "Candle in the Wind." Yeah, Wind, yeah. Benny and the Jets. Oh, Goodbye, man. Yellow Brick Road. What a record. Song. What a record. Uh, Jamaica Jerk Off. Uh, Dirty Little Girl. All the Girls Love Alice. Uh, what's my Saturday All Night's All Right for Fighting? All the young girl, tender young Alice, they yeah. say. Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. Yeah. My Gray Seal, which is like a deep favorite of mine. That's a good song. Look yeah. how many hits were on that record, man. Man. You just can't make this shit up. And what year was that? 75? Uh, three. 73. 73. And look at his output before and after. He had done yeah. another one that did like Credence, right? That's just a He always just, it seemed like he had a new album out every couple of months, it seemed. Like, yeah. You know? Yeah. And then he slowed up. They dry up after a while, you know? And that was all Bernie Toppin and, uh, the, right? Bernie Toppin was yeah. the lyricist on uh, all those. He was with him until Where was the that late... recorded? Caribou uh, Caribou Ranch? No, I think he was still uh This could be Trident. Um but, 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 No, Strawberry Studios in France. Wow. Remixed at Trident Studios. Wow, cool. Yeah. I wonder if uh Roy Thomas Baker did anything. <laughs> yeah. Nah. Great album. Okay, here you go, Perry. Oh, Lou's back. He, he just was disappeared. Yeah. Okay, what, I'm gonna. What, what's next? I'm gonna. You're gonna freak out when you see this because you just want to hear this. And when we're talking about it, <laughs> the first Motley Crue album. <laughs> what's Talk it called? Pop what, rock. What's it called? Sticky Fingers. Too fast for love. They were just a, just a shit band, but Roy Thomas Baker produced it. So he heard something. He agreed to produce that, their first that, album. That doesn't make it good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on our favorite label. Electra it's, like, Asylum. it's like polishing a turd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Electra signed them. So, you know, they've had friends in high places. Oh, look at this. This is cool. It came with a Back. lyric sheet, a separate lyric sheet. Ooh, what? Which what I was yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. That's uh, Motley Crue. Yeah, Lou. Their first album, Too Fast for Love. 
That's their first record. So what kind yeah. of what kind of songs are on Motley Crue's first record? No hits. They had a song called Live Wire, which was actually a video. I saw it on UHF. Channel sixty eight had a metal show on Friday nights. And uh so yeah, but Roy Thomas Baker. He what year it. what year was Motley Crue's first record? Nineteen eighty two. Wow. So he was still doing the cars when that album came out. It's so weird that Roy Thomas Baker was floating between all these worlds, right? Some English guy, yeah, yeah. comes in. And I didn't plan this. But another Roy Thomas Baker, Queen Two. And it was it was uh, divided into a white side and a black side. The white side was more Brian May, and the black side was Freddie Mercury's kind of dark stuff. You know? and it had um, just... Mark, we can't hear Lou. He, uh... Oh, he's trying to get on. Yeah, you got to talk. You got to talk to him about that microphone button or something. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, he... uh, so what's on Queen Two? Sheer Heart Attack? No, that was no. That. Probably nothing you would know. Uh, they did. Oh, Seven Seas of Rye. That was actually a hit. Yeah, yeah, I might, yeah. I've seen that record a hundred times. Yeah, but it, it's probably their worst sounding album because back then Roy Thomas Baker, who knows what he was working with, but he had to do all of Brian May's layerings, all the vocals. He might have been working with a track. So with a track. So then it's so compressed when you hear it. It's it's rough to hear. But um, I love I love the picture. I love that. That is the whole time. Yeah, queen, yeah. You know? If you're a, if you're a queen, can you hear man, me? Yep. Yes, yep. we can hear you. Oh God. Welcome back. Yeah, thanks. So hey, you, quickly, quickly. I, I left while Paul Anka was giving his manager. He was ripping his manager a new asshole. That, that was, was Paul Anka. That was uh, Godfather Two, right? No. No, it, it was just Paul. I I don't know if I heard. A couple we lost your microphone. Hello. We lost your microphone. We can hear you, but it's coming through your uh, webcam. I'm working on it. So if it wasn't Godfather 2... How does Seven Seas of Rye go? Oh, I'm not going to try and sing freaking Freddie Mercury. (laughs) Come on, man. Sing for your supper. (laughs) Well, I'll I'll tell you what. It starts off with a flurry of piano. Right? And then, uh, you know, and then it comes in. It's a... the lyrics are very uh, uh, middle, uh, kind of like from the Renaissance, and uh, I'll tell you right now. Here, ready? Do the very beginning. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I don't want to play anymore. It's Queen. We don't want to fool with. Yeah. That. We don't know. All right, what else have you got? I think I blew the... my speakers, by the way. On well, that. Yeah, it's, it sounded kind of rough, man. <laughs> I think I woke the whole family up. Uh, my, hey, here's a DJ thing. I just dropped all my records. All right. You won't know this, I'm sure. Voyage of the Acolyte by Steve Hackett. He made I would his not, first... I would not. I know he was in Genesis. <laughs> That's all well, I can tell you. He made this you. while he was in Genesis. First yeah. solo album. A lot of people call it the prog version of George Harrison. He had all these songs he had written, but the guys weren't using them. So his first album came out like a big... Yeah, nice enough guy. Um, yeah. Funny enough, Genesis pretty much play on a lot of the songs. Phil Collins on a few songs. So they're all friends, you know, and they just said, eh, yeah. we'll help you make it. And another thing about, see, great artwork. Just awesome. Yeah. What records. year What year was that? Mid-70s? That would be 70. Five or six. Yeah. Yep. Then, then the following year, he left Genesis. Said he was going to be a big rock star. Okay. Yep. The last one. This is a limited edition. And I bought. Do you remember a store called Things from England in Cliffside Park? No, you told me about it one time though. So yeah. I went down yeah. there. It's 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 actually a leather album cover. It's made of leather. It's Motorhead's No Remorse compilation album. Wow. And it's, you can smell it. I pulled it out. And I still smell the leather. Leather. Really. Oh, What's good about it is it's and got what did, stuff. what did that album cost back then? Oh Lord, I probably spent twenty something, which is a hell of a lot of money for the eighties. No, know? but I mean, I mean, when you were talking about these records, like the Elton John Still record crying. with the triple fold, we got you, right? we got you, like the Elton John record, right? That you yeah. showed, which was what was the Elton John record? Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. It opened up to three, so you got all this artwork. There was, yeah. there was, you know, there was the artwork, there were the lyrics, there was this, there was that. 
for what six ninety nine. You got all that, right? But you know what? Back then they were selling so many more units of albums, they could pay for it. Like they could justify the extra packaging. Nowadays, you can't justify it because nobody's buying physical media, you know? Yeah, but I think so. it, it just meant something back then, you know, with the photographers and the artwork and oh, this and yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, Lou, we were talking about Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. And the music. And the music, oh, yeah. yeah. So what I was saying was, sorry, like when you open it up, it's, it opens up three ways, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, and you have a little okay, painting right, right. for each song. So I was telling Perry, I'd sit in my, this was, this was the early music videos for someone yeah. just sitting in their bedroom listening to albums. You're seeing that picture, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, quick recap, Lou. First Motley Crue album, Roy Thomas okay. Baker. Oh, Goodbye wow. Yellow Brick okay. Road. Gus Not Dudgeon, Roy Thomas. Produced, produced by Gus yeah. Dudgeon. Yeah. The Yes album, the game changer for them. I've okay. seen that a hundred times, right? So have you, yep. Perry didn't know this band. I don't know if you do. UFO. Yeah. Okay, and I just explained it was Michael Schenker. Michael Schenker, yeah, yeah. Pink Floyd, a nice pair, which is just basically a repackaging of the two Sid Barrett albums in the mid seventies okay. to try to cash in. You know, mm-hmm. hope I hope Sid Barrett got some of that money. Crossroads soundtrack, which has Jim Keltner on every song and Ry Cooter produce and playing guitar all over it. It's a really good album. And Steve from, Fye from the, playing from the, the devil Crossroads. guitarist. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, and I was telling Mario. I yep. was I was commenting on how poorly it looked like he played guitar. It like I don't think it got faked well at all. I think you know? he did better than other actors. Some actors have been dreadful. Like he who? Actually, like who? Michael, Michael J. Just, Fox, maybe. <laughs> no, he really That's plays. True. But not in really? that movie, though. Michael yeah. J. Fox really plays guitar. I didn't. I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, he was on. Uh, Ralph Macchio was on Mark Maron's show, and he said they let him keep the Telecaster that he made mm-hmm. the movie with. Um, well, hopefully he still has it. Whoops, upside down. Queen, that, another one kiss, two. Oh. Queen two. Oh, cool. Yeah. Another Roy, Roy Thomas. Thomas. Roy Thomas I was telling Baker. Perry, this is the worst sounding album from them, probably because <laughs> they had eight tracks to work with, and he had to get all the vocals, all the guitars. No, eight tracks, really? What year was that? Think, I think, yeah, because this is seventy four, and Trident at Trident Studios. Huh. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but it just, uh, or maybe it was just. He it maybe was sixteen to, track at that point. But also, anyway, he hadn't perfected how still. to bounce everything down. You know, yeah. all those guitars. Um, Do all those first, reduction mixes. Yeah. yeah. The first Steve Hackett album, Voyage of the Acolyte, which I okay. liken to George Harrison's All Things Must Pass, because I was telling Perry that Steve Hackett was writing all these songs, and Phil and Peter Gabriel wouldn't use them, so he comes up with this. I consider it a prog masterpiece. Okay. Very yeah. And very I told time. Mark, tread lightly about calling Motley Crue a punk album. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Mark, well, I, I don't I, like I, punk. I kind of agree with that, but I, I, I'll go I know on record what you mean. It's kind of punky metal in a way, punky. but yeah. I don't like punk. I because I the Clash are not punk, so I don't like punk. No, Jam or never punk. Punky meadows. So this was punky um. Meadows. I was telling Perry but right before you came on. This is actually made of leather. This this album cover, <laughs> and it's a compilation. It's good. It's got like some compilation of, some, of what? Wait, what's in it? Oh, who is it? You should, I thought you would know Motorhead. No, oh no, no Motorhead. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How about that Frank Zappa album, leather, leather. <laughs> <laughs> But on this album, he actually, it's got, and it's really talking about great packaging. See all the, all the pictures. So you see, and then there's like a, a, a thousand word essay on Motorhead on one of the sleeves. That's quality really? packaging. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So I, I, I do like Motorhead. I like them. Yeah. And that was all, all of them, the, right, Mark? There were graphic artists <laughs> employ, you know, the Phil Hartmans of the other world, all the people that put the work into the, actually making the album look like yeah, something. yeah, and it all mattered, yeah. man. You know, yeah, yeah. it all mattered. Yeah, yeah. before, yeah, like I was telling Mark, I said sometime in the sometime, I guess I don't know, in like near nineteen ninety, it just became, you know, a mylar sleeve and yeah. nothing. Yeah. You know, like like those Tom Petty records, mylar Some sleeve, kind of air, nothing, no yeah. artwork, and it, yeah, well, and air, air, airbrushed cover or something. But well, look at this. Have, have any Leibovitz so, to your. Your cover for your album meant something. Yeah, you know? yeah like this, right? Sleeve, yeah. Nothing. Yeah. No, no artwork, no nothing. Yeah. The, other, yeah. the other thing that happened towards the end of records when they were still selling is they got real cheap with them. They were getting thin. And um, they weren't pressing them with as good quality. So yeah. the last track you on the side one. hold them in your hand one, and they wobble. You go yeah. like this. And, and the last wobble, track on wobble, the side yeah. would sound terrible, distorted. So I got like, I was, I was yeah. so happy to see CDs because I didn't want to deal with it. But I didn't realize they were just making them like shit. So, yeah. Yeah. So well, Lou, did you 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 did you mention Paul Anka before? Like, did, did you cut out one during a Paul Anka story? 
Well, it, it, was, it was just a little thing. I because I, I found out that you know I knew who Paul Yanker, Paul Anker was, but the fact that some of the songs that he wrote, he was a very well known songwriter. But he, he was also a bit, a bit of a child prodigy. Um, but you know, as he was a teenager, he was like Rolling the Rolling uh, with the Rolling Stone and Rock and Roll. Wait, no. The Rolling Stone Encyclopedia Rock and Roll called him one of the main purveyors of teen schmaltz. In the early 60s with Diana, you know, I'm just a teenager. Yeah, that, that, kind of that was stuff. him? Oh, please yeah. stay by me, Diana. That was him? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Paul, Paul Anko. As he went, Paul Anko, as he went along, you know, he progressed. But, you know, he, he was a very accomplished songwriter. <clears throat> but there was a funny um, video, uh, audio of him going, tearing his manager new asshole. And it goes something like this. Oh, that was it. Yeah. I thought he was coming. You thought, you thought, you thought, you thought eight things tonight. You're on fucking notice, John. I gave you a list. Get half a list that I gave you. We're choosing everything on it. Okay? The guys get shirts. Don't make a fucking maniac out of me. The guys get shirts. So who is he, who is he berating? This <laughs> It's his manager. <laughs> Holy shit! What a fucking prima donna the guy became. E- e- well, evidently, no. no okay, no, I'm, I'm going to do this. Though. It's Paul Anka. He's been in show business he, he, since yeah. he was a teenager in the golden age of show business, Las right. Vegas. The schmuckery. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. well, you know, Perry. I don't know. I don't want to get into that because <laughs> yeah. Sammy Davis Jr. was an amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, yeah. it was. It was adult entertainment. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so his band was playing in T-shirts. So I, I could picture Paul Anka getting pretty friggin' pissed off about that just you know doing I mean? a show or rehearsal no a show they went they were wearing t-shirts so he he's, he, he wanted the whole band to have you know an image and have like you know shirts right. and outfits they were he's wearing so, a tux yeah pro- most likely or yeah, something yeah. who knows i mean but he's, he's he's dressing up for the gig you know but you know the band's up there wearing t-shirts and he's just going ballistic about it but it gets worse than that i'm not gonna <laughs> but um it's, it's pretty pretty funny though but um so i, I was you know, i'm a big buddy holly fan right I always said, if As Buddy we Holly all lived, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if Buddy Holly lived, the Beatles would not have happened. I disagree with you. I disagree with you. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll make a make movie. A we'll make a we'll make a movie about it. Well, that's like you know, people always go, "Well, right, you know, uh, John, John F. Kennedy got killed, and the country was ready." Like fucking, the Beatles would have happened whether John F. Kennedy got killed or not. You know, the Beatles would have happened. Ha- well, I mean, I, they might have happened in America. Well, they happened in England a year before. But they, as far as going to America, I mean, I would think that sound, I would like to think that sound would have been denied. But the time was ripe. It would, it would, have, it would, have, it would have happened anyway. Got nothing but to do we with were, JFK, we were though. Yeah. yeah, we were definitely right for it. Maybe it wasn't Beatle. Who, who knows? But it, it, it's all contentious. But anyway, he wrote a song that Buddy Holly recorded. I didn't know that. Really? Um, it, it doesn't matter anymore. Da, 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 and it really doesn't matter anymore. One of his more produced things later on. So that's career. what Buddy Holly was in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I always wondered, like, you know, we were always wondered who wrote Buddy Holly's songs beside himself. But I think Norman Petty actually did have something to do, and just as um, Jerry Allison, the drummer, did. Yep. Um, wrote some of the help wrote some of those songs, and I think Buddy Holly was the add-on to Peggy Sue, actually. But anyway, so um, I said when I looked it up, I said Paul Anker wrote that. That's pretty freaking <clears> cool. <throat> What's even cooler, given in spite of what we heard talking to his manager, you know? Yeah. Um, cause we all want to do that. Sometimes everyone's, we all want to rip somebody a new asshole sometimes, you know? Um, Every in, spite day of that, in spite of that, he gave his songwriters publishing rights to buddy's widow back then mm. saying, he goes, this is just a horrible thing and it's going to help his family. So that was a pretty, wow. mag- that was a very magnanimous and generous gesture giving that, you know, so, all right. So for, for Paul Anka, but he also wrote, this is even, I think even better. He wrote She's a Lady that Tom Jones covered. You're kidding me. That's a Paul Lanka song. I know. I was like, wow. holy shit. So, I mean, he was a talented guy, but, you know, that, yeah. Perry, that, 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 and Mark, that's, that's a, a great event. song, man. That's a great song. It, it's on a great par- song. On Parrot Records. Yeah. Tom on Parrot. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, you know, he was that kind of talented guy, whether he was a prima donna. Sure, he was. Well, I think when you're a star, when you're, when you're a teenager, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Like, I think Taylor Swift is probably a prima donna, given the fact mm-hmm. that oh, she's you been know famous it. since you she was 11. It, yeah. Of course she is. But like and, when, and, when anyone, when, yeah. W- did he write Diana? Did, did, did he yeah. write those songs? He, he really? wrote these songs. Wow. Now I heard hmm. him sing on uh, it was on the Ed Sullivan Show on YouTube. It's an Italian song. He sang with uh, I forgot the girl's name. She was it's kind of she was considered a tomboy back then in the early '60s, but she went on to become a big star and people seem to love her. I'm like, anyway, but he did this Italian song with her and, and he could sing. 
Uh, he yeah. was a very talented guy. The music, you know, he was a, he was a showbiz kind of guy. But he did that um, was it Rock Swings when he did versions of Jump. He does a great version of Black Hole Sun. I heard that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that, yeah. <laughs> Only because the music behind Black Hole Sun is really beautiful. Those chord changes are, are wonderful. He heard the music. He didn't see the performance. Did, he heard the music. Did he exactly. really write he, the Johnny Carson theme? He wrote, yeah, he, he wrote the Johnny Carson theme, yeah. The Tonight Show theme. And he wrote the lyrics to My Way. I've heard that, yeah, yeah. And he also had this song. From the who? You're having my your ha- uh, uh, my way. Uh, oh, my wife. oh, my way. <laughs> my wife's in jeopardy. Um, oh no, he wrote "You're having my baby." He wrote right? "You're having yeah. my baby, woman." Um, which, yeah. So, th- th- but when he did that, even back then, that was at the height of the women's liberation movement. You know, the Gloria Steinem, the bra burning, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. escapades. You know, and I saw my actually might have been the Tonight Show or some other variety show. And he goes, "Well, he, he goes, I've caught some kind of flack." I think he was generally chagrined. Mm. So he goes, it, but when he sang, he goes, you're having our baby. So he had I, to do he, that he made, live. Yeah, yeah. Well, he made good. He made good on it. You know? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. You know? But I'm, what a songwriter, man. I didn't know he yeah. wrote that yeah. Tom Jones song. She's a lady. I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised. Cause like, you know, well, when she's I really, you'd ever want yeah. she's the kind yeah. you like to flaunt and take to dinner. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I wonder and, how Paul Anklet, Paul Ankle, Paul Ankle envisioned. Yeah, Paul, Paul Ankle. I wonder how he envisioned the song sounding, though. You know, I think he did a ver- well. I, he did a version. I, I think of that didn't chart. So, mm. I mean, being how what he was throughout those sixties and stuff. Like once those royalty checks started coming in from Tom Jones, he's like, hey, you know. I mean, when we're all young, I mean, I, I think I, I have a friend that could have had some songs published when he was younger. But he's like, no, I'm I'm the one I should do these songs. And looking back, he goes, I was being stupid, you know. Yeah, I should have yeah. sold it to Billy Joel or whoever, even if yeah. you weren't credited and you got, you know, whatever. Um, you know, when you're young, you know the the the, the idealism of of youth, you know. Yeah. yeah. But 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 well, as, as he was in the business since he was a youth, um, he was probably like, hey, you know. So was he a teeny bopper, teeny teen idol? He was a teen idol. Yeah, he was like he was Fabian, and uh, he was one of those yeah. guys. Yes. yes, he was. In yeah. fact, he's got a bit part in the, uh, I think it's The Longest Day, about the D-Day invasion. Um, hmm. Yeah, was so he, he had some acting like a bingo? I don't know if he did, I don't know if he did those type of movies. Actually, I think given his, Holy Elvis prodi- <laughs> given his prodigious talent, even as a kid, he was in more serious things, but I, I can't recall yeah. anything else besides The Longest Day, which is a great movie, by the way. It's an epic. It yeah. is. It's a, yeah. it's a World War II epic, yeah. Um, and, but it was like a walk-on role or something. I guess he was young. Um, yeah. But it's funny, having seen those videos, especially the, the, the Italian song you sang, I'm like, it's very authentic, um, and it was very good. Like, he could sing. The man has talent. He, he's got so, talent. You know, Pat Boone had talent, whether you like it or not. You're going you know? to have to consider him as your Ital- part of your Italo rock segment, I do, right? Oh, I do. I do, no matter how yeah. much, no matter how ill you think of it, Perry, because I know you do. Listen, I, know, I don't think you make fun, I, what you you make fun of Frankie Valli. Just you because I make Frankie fun Valley. of him doesn't mean I wish him ill. Hey, <laughs> Perry no, makes fun, no, Perry makes fun of Zebra. He doesn't wish him ill. He Boy, loves everyone zebra. is so <laughs> temperamental about what they like. And uh, look, hey, God, guys, man. guys, hey, well, man, you look, ask me yeah. my opinion of your argument on Buddy Holly. L- you, know, you know what I think would have happened? I, I, I'd love to know, Mark. I'd love okay, to know. so if he hadn't died, because that was when rock was dangerous, right? You had who was around at that time? You had Buddy Holly. You had. Uh, Little Richard, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. Chuck Berry, yeah. dangerous, it was Chuck subversant. Ray. Yeah, uh, if he had lived, Rock wouldn't have gotten wimped out in the late what late fifties, right? Because yeah. when Rock, Rock wimped out, that gave the Beatles their opportunity to come in, kick yeah. ass again, right? So I say the Beatles would have happened, but I think they would have been more like Jerry and the Pacemakers, where they would have started and not gotten. They wouldn't have been as popular like the way they were to do their own thing. They wouldn't have maybe they wouldn't have hooked they, up they, with they George exploded. Martin. Yeah. So what could have happened? And this is where you say taking a hit for the team. So maybe, you know, Buddy Holly lived, the Beatles came out, they kept doing their thing, and then they never pushed the boundaries. They never made a, um, uh, the, you know, the, the big albums Sergeant that Pepper. changed yeah. rock music. And rock music totally would have been a ripple effect. We may have had just a totally different rock music scene. Right. Now, now Buddy made some... He made some softer material like True Love Ways and stuff. I, I, mm. I think it's a beautiful ballad, but I think he would have kept that rock edge because he was very raw. Yeah. No, maybe he, 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 he would have produced the Beatles. He got wimpy when he went to New York, Buddy Holly. He he did, but I think that was just a brief period right before he died. I don't think that would have been the whole – that might have been part of the tra- trajectory. 
But I think he would have kept some of that rock and roll. He still had it. I mean, the guy was a diehard rock and roll. He wrote some of the best plain three three piece yeah. rock and roll songs. He's still out of Stratocaster. Yeah. I think yeah. in the seventies he might have <laughs> went country. Something tells me. Something tells me. Well, he would have. He, he, he was he, from he, Texas, Mark. Why not? He, 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 yeah, he, he, he would have evolved absolutely. He would have yeah. yeah. been so fucking huge. I mean, he's yeah, already yeah, huge. Yeah. And, yeah. But I'm, again, fa- like, I'm fascinated music, with that story. Yeah, it's kind of like that Beatles movie where the guy bangs his head and he goes into another dimension where the Beatles never right. happened. Do you ever see that? It's like you think of those things. Like, how would a music have progressed? Yeah. Let's face yeah. it, the Beatles really are responsible for most of our avenues of. Well, rock it's always music. you know those are like Quentin Tarantino movies. You know, what if? What, if, what yeah. if what if the Manson people went to the wrong house? Yeah. You know, like, you know, what if Hitler went to this movie theater in France? You know, like we, if, if, if Charlie M had a hit single, would he not want to do Helter Skelter? Right. You know, like, I'm, a, I'm a rock star. Right. You know? yeah. I could have been a sociopathic, a maniac, homicidal killer or whatever. Right? Well, guys, yeah. I think we ought to end this charade. Oh, no, wait. Roger Waters would call it a charade. Charade, right? you are. We're like two and a half hours, guys, man. Well, yeah. that's because I, I had two train wrecks in the course of it. <laughs> well, Fine. You came back quicker. Well, let's, okay. yeah, okay. you came back strong. I have, I have some theories that if we have an after party, I will tell you at our after party what I think is We came back right. strong with the... Uh, Any Patreon right. members. No, just joking. With the Paul Ankle. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Paul, who'd, who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Was a, that was a total shock. I'm like, Buddy Holly and yeah. uh, and, and, um, and Tom Jones. That's great. Yeah, right in that, writing that uh, writing that Tom Jones hit, right? Yep. This thing called love. Yeah. And uh, you're playing those much better now, Mark. I know. Can I re-record it? He must have turned no. his. No, there's no way to re-record it. <laughs> yes, there is actually. If he came down here. Oh, because I I don't know what the chords are. I can't play it again. I have the masters. I'm, oh, you I'm have. I'm going to have my manager sue for the master tape. I've got all the masters. They stay with me until <laughs> I hold you guys at gunpoint. Yeah, right. Um, um, Music Relish Corporation LLC, where we all have lawyers. So you're going to get a yeah. call from my lawyer. That's okay. <laughs> Come down, and guys. Made, Come on down. You made me sign that contract under duress. I had no choice. I remember using blood, actually, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in this tallow rock. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Music Relish Podcast, gmail.com. Spotify. Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast. Overcast. 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 We have friends who have a podcast called Milk Crates and Turntables. And Great don't show. forget our Facebook page. You can hear these songs that we actually talk about in their entirety. If Mark ever uploads them. It's legal there. We we think so. It's legal. We had a good show. We talked about Jesse Ed Davis. We talked about Very Paul Ankle. We talked about Marshall Crankshaft, right? No, we, we didn't. About... No, we didn't. Robert Gordon. Robert Gordon. The Dream Academy. The Dream Academy. 914 Studios. 914 Studios. Brooks, Brooks what? Brooks Robinson. Brooks and Dunn. It was a good show. <laughs> Boot Scoot and Boogie. <laughs> Well, it's about to end, guys. Nighty night. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Good night, listeners. Night.